All right, we are recording and we are live. Okay, um, thank you, Caitlin. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Newburyport Zoning Board of Appeals. My name is Rob Champetti, I'm the chairman. And uh, for those of you uh, who are just logging on, we're gonna take a few moments and just allow uh, you know, a beat or two to go by while folks begin to log themselves on and uh, and uh, trickle in and make sure that they uh, get themselves situated so that we can begin our public hearing for this evening. The uh, meeting date of November 23rd, 2021, it's seven o'clock. So that's our appointed and published time. And I'm going to go through our agenda. Uh, by the way, for those of you that are just um, uh, logging on or perhaps not uh, familiar with a Zoom version, though I suspect almost everyone is, by now, uh, a Zoom version of a public hearing. All of our materials are available on the City of Newburyport's website. Um, and there's a, a very easy to use uh, online application process now with hyperlinks and, and uh, PDF links to almost everything that we'll be making reference to. Uh, and we will also be posting and sharing screens of anything being uh, referenced to or spoken of by either the applicant or, uh, or during the application process. So uh, if you're having trouble pulling documents up, uh, don't worry about that. We'll have it up as well for you to uh, follow along with. So um, without further ado, I'm going to begin this evening by um, calling our role, introducing our board members, establishing uh, a quorum of who can vote and that we have sufficient uh, voting members in attendance. And then we'll get into our public hearings. And the first order of business will be to deal with two requests for continuance uh, so that anyone who might be here in connection with those applications will know uh, early and quickly that uh, they needn't stay on and uh, and just wait only to find out that the matter is being continued. Uh, so uh, we'll go through the, role, the uh, call of the roll and I'll ask uh, members of the zoning board to please respond uh, in your attendance by either saying here or I. Uh, Mr. Moore. Here. Mr. Delisle. Here. Thank you, Mr. Delisle. Mr. Swanton. Here. Mr. Channing. Yes, here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bennett. Yes, here. And uh, I'm Rob Champetti, I'm also here. So that is uh, six members, one, two, three, four, five, six members uh, in attendance and thank you all. Uh, that does establish a quorum. Uh, and uh, just to um, go into the details, um, we uh, require the zoning board, at least uh, we have five voting members uh, and I'm gonna go through for a moment, uh, an introduction of the board and then walk everyone very quickly through a lay of the land of how the meeting will go forward. Uh, so that for those of you that might be new, uh, to uh, the a, uh, ZBA hearing, you'll understand exactly what the flow will be and what the process is. So um, just to uh, begin and introduce the board, we have uh, Mr. Mark Moore, our vice chairman, Mr. Stephen Delisle, our secretary, Mr. Ken Swanton, uh, mem uh, our member, uh, Mr. Walter Channon, member, and also Mr. Gregory Bennick, associate member. Uh, and again, I'm Rob Champetti. So um, we uh, have established a quorum. We've taken our roll call. And uh, we'll go into our public hearings in just a moment, but um, to give you a lay of the land of how this meeting will go forward, we begin every meeting by reading the public legal notice. Uh, the legal notice is basically a brief description by myself uh, of what was published on uh, the, um, uh, the, the abutters list and what was published in the notice of abutters as well as the application. It's a brief description of the property address, the applicant by name, and a description of the subject matter of what the applicant is seeking relief for um, in with respect to uh, whether they're seeking a special permit or a special permit for non-conformities or a variance. I'll describe that just by briefly stating as much and then a, a brief sort of narrative description of what the uh, applicant seeks to, to do. After we read the public notice, I will invite the applicant or the applicant's representative to present the application. That's the first step of the process. Uh, the application will be presented by the applicant uh, or uh, by the applicant's attorney, uh, architect, or otherwise the representative. Upon the completion of that application process and any materials that are associated with it, which we'll of course put up on the, on the shared screen, I'll then close that portion of the public hearing, of the public hearing and we will um, at that point take Public comment. This is when we will open the um, open the hearing for um, for uh, public comment to um, for members of the public to offer their uh, their input. We will put up a slide which will just give you a little bit of the lay of the land on on uh, our public comment section of the public hearing. We ask that you kindly respect the courtesy of about a two minute interval. Um, we do ask that you give your name and your address. Uh, and then you don't you don't need to come down in a column of pro or con for or against just simply uh, speak your mind and, and this way we can uh, record your thoughts we will then uh, at the end of that period we'll close the public comment period uh, portion of the public hearing and we will go from we will go to a section called questions uh, from the board this is when members of the ZBA will ask 
questions of the applicant, the applicant's representative, oftentimes uh, a public comment itself. Um, and if that public comment is posed in the form of a question, um, I'll ask members of the audience, um, please don't expect an answer from us uh, in response, though know that we're absorbing that question and you may very well hear part or parts of your question posed by a board member to the applicant, uh, sort of an adapted way to take in that information and, uh, and, and project it back out so we can get to the bottom of that, that material. Um, we will go through the questions uh, from the board, after which we'll close that portion of the public hearing and we go to deliberations. Deliberations is just the legal segment of this hearing process whereby uh, you as members of, uh, of, of the public and my, ourselves and the applicant all get to hear members of the ZBA think out loud and, and uh, deliberate the legal criteria that must be met, the legal standards that must be met, whether we feel that they're met or whether we have further questions, you'll, all, you'll hear that all be unpacked sort of in real time. Um, once we've completed our deliberations, we close that portion of the public hearing. And as chairman, I uh, then uh, sort of I, I um, adapt a um, an adapted version of Robert's rules of order. We will um, I will then elicit a, a, a um, or invite a motion to be made uh, by a member of the ZBA, and that motion is always going to be made in the affirmative. Um, it will be a motion to approve, but but rest assured that doesn't mean that that member of the zoning board plans to support the application. It's really more of a procedural way to get the question onto the uh, the table for a vote. So um, the way that happens mechanically is a member of the ZBA will make a motion to approve, no matter how they feel about it. Uh, that motion must be seconded by another member. Once it's made and seconded, we take a vote. And uh, in order for an applicant's application to be successful, they must have four votes in the affirmative. So that would be four yes votes. Um, and just to point out, uh, we have um, six uh, voting members of the Z we have six members of the ZBA this evening in attendance, uh, and uh, I'm going to just list the um, the voting members of the ZBA by application, um, notwithstanding the matters that are going to be continued, which is uh, 65 Mirza Mill. We'll do in a moment. 1721 State Street, which we'll do in a moment. Um, the uh, first uh, the first substantive application uh, before us will be to Neptune Street, and um, when we get there, I will just before I turn it over to Mr. Moore to continue to chair that hearing. I'll just cite that uh, who our five voting members are. So at the beginning of each application, you'll know who the five legal voting members are for each application. So uh, without further ado, I just wanna also note that uh, in attendance as well from the uh, from the planning office, we have, of course, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Caitlin Sullivan, our city planner, as well as uh, Ms. Jennifer Blanchet, our uh, Stoning Codes Enforcement Officer, and uh, Ms. Gretchen Joy, our Keeper of the Minutes. Um, when you do speak, uh, if you choose to speak in the public comment section, it is important to make sure you give your name and address again so Ms. Joy can record your, um, your, uh, your thoughts and uh, your concerns or your support or what have you. Uh, and uh, so with that, we will um, now get into our first matter uh, on the public hearings, um, which is on our agenda. And it is, we have a motion to continue the application by Brendan Johnson and Chris, uh, Christina Krell Johnson on the, the application of 65 Curzon Mill Road. Uh, this is a dimensional variance. Um, and uh, do we have, I believe this has been continued once already from the meeting of 1026. Uh, and um, let's see, Caitlin, when, when are they looking to continue to? Oh, hi, uh, Chair. Um, so the applicant is not expected to be present tonight. Uh, the request on the table right now is a request to withdraw uh, without prejudice. Thank you. Okay, and uh, my apologies. Okay, so the motion uh, before us is a request to withdraw without prejudice. Uh, do we have a motion uh, from the members of the ZBA? We just need a motion from, from someone uh, to, uh, to withdraw without prejudice, seconded, and then we'll take it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll make that motion um, for uh, 65 Curzon Mill Road to withdraw the application for a dimensional variance application 2021-06 uh, to withdraw without prejudice. Thank you, Mr. DeLisle. Do we have a second? A second at Ken Swanton. Thank you, Mr. Swanton. Motion's made by Mr. DeLisle, seconded by Mr. Swanton uh, on the uh, applicant's request to withdraw without prejudice. Um, Mr. Moore. I've been recused on this application, so. Oh, thank you, thank no you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Duwile. Yep. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Swanton. Yes. Mr. Channing. Yes. Mr. Bennett. Yes. Uh, and Rob Champetti, I vote yes. That's five in the affirmative. The ayes have it. The motion carries. Uh, the matter of 65 Curzon Mill has been withdrawn without prejudice. Thank you. 
Uh, moving to the next matter, uh, it's Caswell Restaurant Group, Inc., care of Lisa Mead, Mead, Tellerman & Costa, LLC, 17-21 State Street. It's an appeal, uh, and it has been continued from 10-12-2021, and uh, the request has been made uh, to uh, continue further. Uh, Attorney Mead, do you wish to be heard on the request or just uh, have us proceed on the, um, on the written request? Well, I... Um, Mr. Chair, Lisa Mead, Mead Tellum Costa, on behalf of the applicants, the Caswell Restaurant Group, um, we're requesting to continue to February 8th. I think at the last meeting, the board asked for more detail relative to that um, request, and I have submitted all of that in writing. So um, I'm happy to address any questions, but I, I think that the, the record does include that information. Thank you, Attorney Mead. Um, so the uh, request uh, before the board is a, a continuance to February 8th, 2022. Uh, do we have a motion on the request? So moved, Mr. Moore. Greg Bennick, I will second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Bennick. Motion's made and seconded on the motion to continue to February 8th, 2022. Calling the roll, uh, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Delisle. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Uh, yeah, thank you for providing the detail and yes. And uh, Mr. Channing. Yes. Mr. Bennick. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> Rob Champetti, I vote yes as well. That's uh, six in the affirmative. The ayes have it. The motion carries. Matter is continued. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Attorney Mead, for that detail as well. Um, moving now to the next matter, which I will be stepping down uh, just out of continuity of chair. Um, um, Mr. Moore will be continuing to chair the matter of 2 Neptune Street. Before I hand things over, I'm just going to note uh, that based on our, um, our quorum, the uh, voting members the five voting members on this application will be uh, Mr. Moore, Mr. Delisle, Mr. Swanton, Mr. Channon, and Mr. Bennett. And uh, with that, uh, I turn it over to uh, Mr. Moore. Thank you, uh, Chairman Champetti. Um, so our first uh, public hearing tonight is uh, a application that's been continued several times, most recently from uh, the 9th of this month. It's a uh, Patty M. Bampost 2 Neptune Street 2021-26 special permit for nonconformities for an upward extension of a pre-existing nonconforming structure by way of changing the roof line. Um, this is the newest um, iteration of this application. And at this time, we will hear from applicant, uh, Ms. Bampos. Yes, good evening. Um, my name is Patty Ann Bampos. This is a continuation of the application for the upward extension of 2 Neptune Street. Um, after reviewing and listening to the concerns from Mr. Delisle and Mr. Swanton about visibility and massing in the last few meetings, and also concerns from the Preservation Trust members, I have really downsized the project to a point that I hope all, um, a point that I hope amenable to all. If we could go to the, I think the uh, first slide of the drawings. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, as a summary, the entire dormer has been removed from the plans. Uh, the, the size of the dormer was a big issue from multiple angles. And so I have removed it entirely from the drawings. Now it's an upward extension of the roof line that is resulting in a roof pitch change. For me, this will provide some usable uh, ceiling height under the skylights um, so that I can move and function and have a storage uh, on the second floor. If you could go to the first drawing. So the first drawing, um, as you can see in the revised drawings, the vertical dormer has been completely removed. What remains in essence is a roof line change. By keeping the a two and a half foot wall above the kitchen windows, um, which this wall was part of the last set of drawings and framing from that point to the ridge line, the pitch changes from a 10 pitch to an eight and a half pitch. For reference, the front roof is a 14 pitch, which is steeper than a 45 degree angle. Keeping that two and a half foot wall will allow me greater ceiling height, uh, mainly needed in the bathroom to fully utilize the space. It will also help with increased linen storage and the ability to completely uh, comply with building safety code. As I am losing three vertical windows that would have been part of the dormer, 
I added three skylights um, to bring light into the smaller, darker spaces. If we could go to the next slide. You can see that um, on SG-11, the ceiling is, um, even with the new ceiling, it's gonna be too small to add hanging lights. All five of the skylights will provide light on the second floor. And I just have to make a correction. What you see uh, on the lower right corner, it appears as if the two higher skylights are on the third floor. They're actually on the second floor. Um, and it was mislabeled that they were attic skylights. All of those skylights, all five are for light on the second floor. The two on um, the left and the right would just be closer together. Uh, so I, I do apologize for that. I didn't catch that until today. Uh, removing the dormer and pursuing a roof line change will preserve the long view of the roof driving down Water Street, which was a concern by several members. There is a dogwood tree visible in my neighbor's yard that softens the front corner of the roof. Even now you, you can see it um, when you're driving down the street. So this roof line change is not a change that I anticipate to be highly visible as in someone driving down won't notice it right off the bat. I spoke with the building commissioner about working on the roof so close to the street. And he indicated that I would get a sidewalk permit to temporarily close off the sidewalk while work was underway. Uh, the pictures that I have at the end of the presentation um, clearly show other homes also within close proximity to the street with recent work done. If we could just go to the next slide. This is uh, the drawing from the other side. So the rear, what's considered the rear side of the house as the uh, property has two front yards. So you can see right now that the existing roof in the top drawing is above um, 2.5 Neptune. Then in the bottom, you can see that there is a change, but it's really not a marked change. It's a very slight change in roof pitch. If we could go on to the next slide. So this is just showing the um, roof line change and what it looks like inside the bathroom. Uh, the green box is the area inside the bathroom where the height would be six foot eight, which is a requirement of the uh, building safety code. That's why um, the 2.5 foot wall was maintained, um, just so that I can keep that on the left side of that bathroom window. Uh, the next slide, please. So what I, what I included here, and there are three slides, is a table of approvals by the ZBA, which is a sampling of upward extensions approved by the board just across the city. So Plum Island and then, um, you know, north, south, all areas of the city. Sheet one, which is this sheet, is approvals in 2021. And um, sheets two and three are approvals in 2020. Several of the projects were on corner lots, had concerns from preservation trust or other members increased lot coverage or were very close to the street. So I just tried to put this summary together to just show what my neighbors are doing and actually what was reviewed um, and what was approved by the board. If we could go down to the first picture. So these first two pictures are pictures of 249, 251 Water Street. Um, which I believe was approved last year. Uh, a very highly visible location. Um, dormers were put on both sides of the attic, which is a difference from the prior uh, house structure. 
it's um, very close to the sidewalk. It's three feet from the sidewalk and the lot coverage is intensified for this property. So this is, this is one of my neighbors that's currently um, doing work. If we can show the next slide, which is just the same building, just from the opposite angle. Um, I was just walking and taking pictures. You can see they're doing a great job. I think they're doing it by themselves. Um, the next slide, please. This is a picture of 159 Water Street, um, again, in a highly visible location. This is on uh, in an area where the uh, driveway to go into the sewerage treatment plant is. It's right on the corner. And I included this because this has a second floor extension um, on the back half of the house. So if you look at that vertical beam in the middle, it was from that point backwards to increase head height. And this building sits actually right on the sidewalk. Um, and you can see that from the next slide, if that's possible. So you can see here, there's um, this house has been undergoing work for quite a while um, and it sits right on the sidewalk as they are doing um, their work. The next slide, please. This is an older property. Um, actually, it's new construction of an older property, uh, 6 Bromfield Street. And this property had a demo delay. I think that this was approved in either 2018 or 19. Uh, this was an upward extension. And it also sits right on the sidewalk. The next slide, please. Uh, this is 8 Harrison Street. And this had a roof line change to accommodate the oversized windows on the third floor. Um, I know that there was much discussion. I'm not sure if it was with the Preservation Trust or the Historic Commission um, about the nature of the windows and size of the windows, but the roof line was adjusted um, to accommodate these windows. So I have, these are just included as you know, examples in my immediate neighborhood to show things that have been approved. And um, I have done my best to listen to the concerns from the zoning board members um, that were voiced and make changes to answer those concerns while also attempting to increase ceiling height and storage for 21st century living. You know, in reading the minutes of all of the approved special permit applications, it was mentioned more than once how applications satisfied the criteria for a special permit, that the project is not more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing conditions and no new nonconformity would be created. Uh, my house would continue to be a single family home the footprint would not be expanded and no new nonconformities would be created. So I am asking the board to please approve this modified extension. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vampos. Um, with that, we will close that portion of the hearing and move to um, eliciting public comment. To recall from the, from the opening preamble, we should all be very familiar with electronic raising of the hand and when you're when you're called to speak um, and, and make comment please remember to unmute yourself your name and address before you start comment all right up first we have thomas colter john go right ahead hello can you hear me sure can thank you tom colter john 64 federal street co-president of the new report preservation trust the trust continues to oppose this proposal in the strongest terms possible. This building is a post and beam structure. The way post and beam framing works is that the entire frame, which is actually pegged together, is one piece and could be figuratively picked up and moved anywhere. It is self-supporting and integral. All members of the frame rely on all the other members for structural strength. Reframing the roof to raise it will remove a large portion 
that gives it both strength and resistance to racking. Racking is when the structure is forced out of plumb. It basically destroys the integrity of the frame and the purpose of post and beam construction. Most modern structural engineers are totally unfamiliar with historic houses and first period houses in particular. Getting a modern engineer's report is not going to solve this problem. The owner of the other part of this building is absolutely correct. His unit would be adversely impacted and also lose its structural integrity. He should not be forced to pay or deal with the applicant's desire for more space. Just imagine the Im impact riding or walking along Joppa when encountering this first period house if the roof were raised. It sits very close to the street and would have a negative impact on the character of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coulter, John. Who's up next? I'm not seeing any other hands at this time, Chair. All right, we'll give it a second. Oh, no, yeah. here we go. There we go. Um, next up, we have Stephanie Nikitic. Go right ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, you know, I understand that in that Tom Colter John was addressing something that the most immediate about her, the the person who has a shared wall unit um, in this house, is concerned about, and he he wrote a letter to you. Um, so I just wanted to point that out to maybe to uh, board members who had not had an opportunity to read that letter because it just appeared to me, to me anyway this morning. So he is concerned about the structural um, problems that this project may create for his, um, his side of the building. Um, so uh, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else either having called in or by name with a raised hand? Yes, we have a caller beginning with um, 970 ending in 407. Go right ahead. Hello, this is Reg Bacon. Am I coming in loud and clear? You sure are. Oh, good. Uh, I'm at uh, I'm Reg Bacon at uh, 21 Strong Street in uh, Newburyport. Uh, uh, this has been on my radar for uh, the multiple continuations, uh, and uh, this meeting, I thought uh, that I would only be contributing a uh, lament uh, to a, a building that's already been too far compromised, in in my view. Uh, but uh, at least I would say that the, the form, uh, the, the shape of the building would have been preserved. In fact, if you look back at how uh, salt box uh, structures were originally, uh, that originally came into being, uh, they were not built that way originally. They were enlarged to accommodate changing needs. So I can almost see that, uh, you know, uh, see the, this as a 21st century uh, kind of uh, adapt, adaptation of a salt box. Uh, the form uh, may be preserved with this present plan, uh, but I'm also concerned that in 30 or 50 years that, uh, you know, uh, newcomers to Newburyport will be uh, really unable to discern a, uh, an authentic building from a reproduction. Uh, I will say that the future architectural historians uh, may look at a building like this and all the other buildings that have these wart-like uh, uh, shed dormers uh, to be perfect examples of uh, the bloated reimaginations of uh, the early forms, uh, but uh, also evidence of our losing our architectural uh, authenticity. But with the letter from the... Uh, uh, the owner from the uh, the other side of the building, uh, 
it makes me think of the uh, structural intrusion on the post and beam architecture uh, to be a uh, essential consideration. And the, the zoning board uh, apparently has uh, authority to call in an independent expert on uh, 17th century post and beam construction. And I would urge the board uh, to do that if it uh, finds somebody to do so. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bacon. Anyone else out there, Caitlin? I don't see any new hands at this time, Chair. All right, I'll give it a I'll count down. No new hands. All right, we'll close public comment and move on to questions from the board, beginning with Mr. Delisle. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, Ms. Bampos, um, we'll get right to the the heart of the comments, I suppose. What um, what sort of uh, measures are would you be taking if your construction were to move forward to um, alleviate the concerns of the uh, of the shared wall neighbor? You know, well, first I would have to get someone who would quote on it. Uh, I don't know how to evaluate something when it's inside the wall. So I don't know what we would be running into. I know that work has been done over the years. There are brackets that I have exposed that are, that are beautiful, that I've been told have been put in in the last hundred years or less. Um, I mean, I would absolutely take recommendations of what you believe I should do since I've never done this before. I could use some guidance on how to proceed evaluating. Okay. Um, how, how does this, you, you, in, when you're, during your presentation, you mentioned the, um, the, uh, the knee wall was, was, uh, first conceived of in the, the last iteration of the plan. So is it correct that so this, this knee wall in this iteration goes the full uh, uh, width of the house as opposed to with the, in the last iteration, it was only under the dormer, but now it goes the full width of the house. Is that, is that right? In the last set of drawings, the knee wall, if that's what I should be calling it, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Oh, well, whatever you called it was fine. I, I'm not yeah. trying to insert yeah. new terms. In the in the last drawing, that knee wall was the entire length of the building, um, and that was only put in because if I were to bring in the dormer at that point, three feet six inches, with the current slope, I wouldn't be able to qualify to meet building safety code. So it was in talking with the architect of, well, how, you know, how can I bring it in three, three feet, six inches and still meet the six foot, eight inch ceiling height requirement. And so we discussed bringing the wall up to change the roof pitch. So that was across the entire uh, backside of the house in, okay. in the last set of drawings. And okay. so I just maintained that. Okay, thank you. Um, in the raising of the roof is the existing roof going to be taken off entirely and thrown away and replaced with new material um, or how would that work i anticipate that yes it will be um, entirely removed but i don't think that i know 100 percent for sure until that happens the, the shingles are rotting, and I, I do know, know that for a fact. Uh, there's quite a big sag in the roof, although nothing is leaking. So I can't visualize what, what's happening. When the front of the house was redone to accommodate the solar panels, the purlins were removed, and the purlins were really kind of dried up, and they had shrunk, and they were warped. So they really could not be used um, for anything because they were just mis misshapen. I almost anticipate that that will be the same 
on this backside. Although if yeah. someone wants them um, for a museum or as a model or for research, I could certainly donate them. Okay, um, I have no more questions, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Delisle. Mr. Swanton. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Hello. Hello. Um, say, Caitlin, I was wondering if you could, the, the letter has come up a couple of times uh, that came in from the person in the other side of the house. I'm wondering if you could put it up for a moment because I had a question about it. Yeah, there it is. And particularly point one and two in the middle there. Um, I see um, this letter came in from the person on the other side of the house saying they had two concerns. One was raising the wall uh, facing town by three feet would meaningly affect, alter the light and our views to the water. I realized the benefit to this property of two Neptune, but this is to our detriment and may impact our property value accordingly. And number two has already been talked about, about the structure altering part of a 220 plus year old home structurally will have an inevitable structural impact on the rest of the home. I view this as a risk to my own property and it's not one I'm interested in managing or can afford to manage at this time. I, I guess my question to the applicant is, have you, uh, when is the last time you've actually discussed your plans with the person who, who shares your structure with you? Because these are, you know, these are concerns that you know, I think are important to discuss. Have you discussed this with him recently? Uh, no, I have not. We have not, I've not really seen really uh, much activity on the other side in the last year. Uh, they really have not been around. But I can say that in the beginning of 2020, um, they did support this project. And um, on March 11th of 2020, uh, Adam wrote to me saying, um, hi, Patty Ann, happy to write a letter of support, but can you share the designs you had done so I can see what we are supporting? If we ever want to go through the same process, the work we do on our side should be fairly similar. Then on April 22nd, 2020, and worth saying, of course, but the impetus for this is my desire to support your plan with Gusto knowing that it meshes seamlessly with something fairly similar and reasonable on our side, attic versus second floor is in parentheses, as I expect it will. And then he proceeded to forward conceptual plans that they had done for a dormer with three windows out of their attic from the architect that provided my plans. So, and then later, right before the historic commission meeting, um, he wanted to explain that he was withdrawing his support because it would uh, subsequently reduce the view from their deck by 30%. And that they didn't plan to build a dormer on their side. So it's simply not in our best interest. So we haven't really talked about the dormer per se because it, it seems as though he was, he and, and the family were supporting me initially when it was a project that fit into their future project. And um, since they decided not to pursue the dormer on their side, then they were not going to support um, the building of my dormer on my side. At that point in time, he did not voice any structural concerns. It was more of a, a view issue that, that I would be impacting their view. Um, so they were supporting me when it was convenient and now they're not supporting me because it's not convenient. Um, the key is though that they did have drawings done and they were thinking about doing it and they may do it in the future. I have no idea. I don't know where they stand on that. Um, we do have a shared wall, partially. Uh, it's really, I wish I almost had an overview drawing looking down on the property. The, the most of the shared wall is from the just 
on the back side of the chimney moving forward. Um, I don't think you could see that from the um, the elevation drawing. It's most of the shed, most of the L is not part of, of his property. So we might only be talking the middle of the house. The, the chimney is in the middle of the house. Um, maybe one or two feet on the back side of the chimney and then the rest of it is the front side. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if we've got another picture coming in from the deck. I think I only have an elevation picture that would help. And even that I don't think shows where it intercepts. But, um, you know, just to go back to the, yeah. So that chimney and the hearth around it is actually huge. So you can see the chimney at the top, but the building out around it because there are multiple flues, um, it's, it's much, much bigger. It's almost, boy, looking at this drawing, I would say, you know, a quarter of an inch of that gray shaded is at least a shared wall. Obviously it needs to be scaled up um, for real space, but that top window is in a very small room. There's a bookshelf right next to the chimney and there's, a, there's an access space so that you can get in to the backside of the chimney. So that could definitely be resupported um, with steel if necessary. I mean, this, that, that is something that would need to be really looked at. I'm not uh, sure if I answered your question. Uh, well, I mean, I was basically just curious, you know, since we've received two letters from him, if you've talked to him about this recent idea and, and you answered the question, so thank you. Um, I, I, you know, I just wanted to also respond to your comments about you know, the 15 other things we've approved this year. You know, I went down that list of all the things from this year and there were a lot of special permits, but there are none that I could find right on top of the street. Um, so it's, it, it, to me, you know, I don't wanna say you can't do something because some people say you have the oldest house in town, but on the other hand, the, the flip side isn't also appropriate where you, should be able to do something because you have the only host, oldest house in town. So I, I just, I'm trying to treat them all very consistently. Uh, you know, I, I know you pointed to some houses like your neighbor across the street, but on Water Street, there's no change on the stuff right on Water Street. Um, so I, I, I don't, I hear you, I admire your persistence, uh, but I, I have no other questions, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swanton. Uh, Mr. Chagnon. Uh, Chair, I've got no questions. Uh, I think the drawings uh, speak clearly what the changes are. Uh, I understand them and, uh, and we can move on from there. I'm Very fine, good. thank you. Uh, Mr. Benick. I have no questions. We've plumbed this project uh, quite deeply. Uh, excellent. I will, um, I will take the, the, a moment to ask um, one question, in the, um, Ms. Pampos, in addition to not having spoken to the immediate abutter about the recent changes, I know early on in, in this application process with the first few iterations, which were dormer, you had a lot of neighborhood support. And I wondered if you'd gone back to those people with this latest iteration and if you had any feedback on that, because I didn't see any. I did not go back um, individually to people um, and ask them because from the beginning, most people just appreciated the pure fact that the house is being worked on and loved and cared for. And anything that I had done up until that point, people loved. So most of the initial uh, comments were, you know, I hope that you get it, you know, regardless of what size drawing is being presented. So I did not go back to anyone. Um, this would be a much, a much smaller scale, a much downsized 
a vision of what I had. I'm, I'm really trying to please everyone as much as possible and just trying to live in the space um, a little bit more in the 21st century um, with everyone else. So, I mean, I could go back and ask my neighbors to resubmit letters if that was necessary. That would not be a problem or an inconvenience. It was just, uh, no, thank you. I, I, Vance, I just didn't know if you had and, uh, and that, that works for me. So I have no further questions and we will go, we'll close that portion of the hearing and go to uh, deliberations and we'll start out uh, with Mr. Delisle. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, I think with regard to the latest iteration of the plan here, I still remain concerned about, you know, what the what we're really doing here. Again, is it really vastly different than the first iteration of the plan with the very giant uh, dormer? Is this just a giant dormer that now spans the whole roof? I don't know. Um, it's something that certainly uh, changes the structure and not in a way that creates a new nonconformity, but uh, creates the upward extension that we're here to, to consider. Um, and in that regard, is it substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood? Well, we have to consider the factors, which are the size, scaling, massing, volume, and location of the proposed extension or alteration uh, as compared to the existing structure and lot. That's the critical key for me here. And the existing structure is tricky because the existing structure is two living units. One person is in, you know, is proposing this and the other is against it, yet in comparing the, the structure, we have to consider the other side, the 2.5 Neptune Street, um, because they're connected. So I, I think that that really is a problem uh, for me as I, as I wrestle with this. And this is certainly uh, something to wrestle with. I think that, you know, Ms. Bampos, you, as Mr. Swanton noted, uh, he commended you on your persistence and I would, I would do the same um, and your creativity to to get to a place to, to serve all, all purposes here. And for me, I'm just still, I'm still concerned about, uh, about the, the, the size, the scale and the massing. Uh, and those are my comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Delisle. Mr. Swanton. Um, I, I concur with Mr. Delisle, uh, I think, the problem here is this, the massing, the, the increase in height is, uh, we didn't see it tonight. I pulled up an old uh, plot plan to check on at home here, but it's very, very, very close to the street. We're talking about going up. And um, this is not something we generally do to go right on a busy street to go up. Um, and it's, I, I, I said earlier, I don't think we should, make an exception just because some people think it's the oldest house in town. Uh, I, I think we should set that aside and just say, what do we do in general? Um, and then the fact that the person on the other side of the house has written us not one, but two letters now with a lot of concern about it. So I, 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 I because of the massing in this example, um, I, I have, um, I can't support it as being uh, something that we can approve. All right. Thank you, Mr. Swanton. Mr. Chagnon. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I can I can certainly support this. I, I was actually in support of the Dormer, and I appreciate the applicant uh, listening to uh, to the board over the last uh, four or five meetings. And uh, you know, I, I uh, kudos to her. I think for uh, for shrinking this down to what. I guess I would have thought would have been uh, would have been acceptable because most of the uh, most of the discussions previously were on the fact that 
we had a massive change, this huge dormer. You don't put a dormer on a salt box. You don't put a dormer on a uh, you know, historical building. And uh, this is essentially a, a, a roof pitch change of, with a 2.5 foot extension on the rear wall. Um, I, I would guess 90% of the people walking by this house wouldn't be able to tell uh, if you increase the height of the rear wall two and a half feet. Um, so, so again, my hat's off to the applicant for making the change, um, but I, I can support it as I could support the dormer. I can certainly support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chagman. Mr. Benick. Yeah, I, I, uh, it struck me that what was driving uh, the board's concern primarily at least and the community's concern was the historic nature of this structure. Uh, I had a different view on that. Uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Bacon, who observed that this historic this historic building has been uh, significantly compromised over the years. And uh, with that in mind, I, uh, uh, as much as I re uh, respected the historic commission's observations. I found that the structure uh, just did not have those historic values that would cause me to uh, reject the dormer project because I secondly found that uh, the massing and scaling is totally consistent with the neighborhood there and, the, and its relative size on the street, again, is not uh, out of proportion to that entire area. So we have this application, which in my view is much more consistent with the historic nature of a salt box. I don't think there's any standard pitch for a salt box. I haven't found anything in my anecdotal reading about architectural values in salt boxes. So uh, I think this is simply a, uh, a, you know, an adaptation of a historic building to reflect what's going on in the 21st century. So, uh, and I applaud the applicant for her persistence in, uh, in this regard. Uh, I, uh, and I'll reiterate my views that I uh, do not believe that this structure is in any way uh, inconsistent uh, with the scale and massing uh, in the neighborhood in any way. In fact, it is much smaller than most of the uh, structures there. Uh, I do have a concern, and I think it's a legitimate concern that my colleagues raise regarding the neighbor. Uh, and I'll make two observations. First, uh, I don't think the way the house is configured and the way the sun moves, I don't see any issue regarding uh, um, uh, well, let me say, I don't see any issue regarding uh, visibility to the water, the way the structure of the house is and the windows are in the existing house. As to the sun and the light, uh, I take the point that there is some, uh, there may be some marginal impact there. Uh, uh, there is virtually no project that we deal with uh, which does not have some impact on those. And uh, uh, I don't view those as being compelling considerations unless there is a detailed shadow analysis showing how it's going to genuinely affect the community and the neighbors. Uh, then I get to the point of the structural integrity and the issues regarding that, which are significant in my view. And uh, I, I will ask this of my colleagues. I mean, I, I assume that these, that, well, I would have assumed had this passed that there would be some review of those plans by the building inspector here, uh, or some way to, to have a check and balance on what I perceive to be a significant issue. Although the anecdotal comments here don't, don't convince me uh, in any way uh, that this project couldn't be undertaken safely. Uh, so with those comments, uh, I stand where I was before, 
this project is, is more consistent with issues that I view to be critical to this application, and I would approve it. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Um, I'm, I'm gonna dovetail off of my colleague, Mr. Bennett, in, in saying that, uh, and trying to skip the, some of the points he made as well as Mr. Chagman. And, and with all res due respect to colleagues who've had concerns, uh, legitimate concerns, I, I can't riff this, so I wrote it down, so I'll have to read this. Uh, first of all, I think we all appreciate the time and persistence and investment uh, that, that the applicant has put into this, um, this process and trying to get this living space uh, improved in her mind. Um, what I see here is that we have an, an historic uh, first generation home that some would like to see unaltered to preserve its um, historic form and appearance. The applicant's gone through the process of, of delay um, in order to get to this point and, and present plans that she'd like to work with. So I thought, well, let me look at the ordinance specific to this demo delay. And uh, taking some quotes and, and paraphrasing some, um, it, it was crafted to acknowledge and work to preserve whenever possible the architectural, cultural, and economic history of Newburyport as it's been seen as one of its most valued uh, assets. And I think we can all agree there. Um, later, it goes on to say the preservation, rehabilitation, and enhancement of the city's historic character is critical to the preservation of the city's heritage and land values. Again, I don't think anyone would argue that. However, in looking at 28E number one of the, of the zoning ordinance as it pertains to the demo delay process, uh, it states that, quote, the section is not intended to regulate the mere alteration of a historic building or structure even if the alteration involves a the demolition of character defining exterior architectural features. So when I saw that, I thought, well, that it, since a lot of the concerns have been about the architectural feature of the salt box roof, um, I like my colleagues saw this removal of the dormer portion in keeping with the historic nature of that architectural defining exterior uh, that we're trying to preserve, albeit there is a bump up with a wall. Um, so if it's if the architectural restriction is removed from my thought process, then I'm just looking at size and massing and scale. And I won't reiterate what some of my colleagues said, but I, I don't see that bump up. When you look at the neighborhood, uh, the bump up in the wall and the size of that uh, and the impact of that roofline change, I don't see that being substantially more detrimental. When you look at the neighborhood, there are many taller buildings, many dormers that I don't think were original. Um, uh, and we have established in prior meetings that this is a private home. It's, it's had changes to it with you know, solar panels, windows haven't been historically preserved, doors have been added. So in that respect, you know, maybe I think preserving the roof line, uh, as Mr. Bennett said, is is a nice way to try to go about appeasing everybody here. And I acknowledge that the immediate neighbor is the most affected uh, by the change. And I do agree that there are some real legitimate concerns about the interaction of the two buildings and the construction. And it, I think it would have been, I think we can all agree it would have been helpful to have a structural engineer to to ask these questions, but these concerns um, would obviously have to be addressed uh, if this was to move forward. Um, long way of saying, I, I too can support it, but unfortunately the math doesn't work that way with this right now. Um, there would have to be four to approve this and, uh, and we only have three. So given that this is the sixth iteration, I think of trying to get this done and we're at the end of November, um, and the applicants on the approval clock, the demo delay, which would end on uh, the 19th of February, I believe. Um, I, I just wanted to, um, before moving from this uh, situation, uh, closing deliberations and then moving towards uh, a vote or presenting another option to the applicant, after hearing that since uh, Mr. Lyle and Mr. Swanton, you went first, I just wanted to ask you if anything that you've heard from your from the board subsequent to that has had any impact on your decision making process and, and if so how and if not if you if you had any further comment um love to hear it uh, mr delisle 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Moore. Sure. Uh, I think that the uh, the comments of of the other three members uh, um, were persuasive and also uh, w well stated. Um, but I, at this point, I'm still uh, I still have grave concerns, and um, despite the uh, the well stated sentiments of of the three members in support of the application, um, my my opinion has not been been moved. Thank you, Mr. Bell. And this is not to say that you shouldn't have said that your opinion wasn't well stated as well as Mr. Swanton's. Um, we just want to get the, the circle back before we go to the next level. So Mr. Swanton, would you like to comment? With unmuting them. Uh, thank you. No, I appreciate everybody's uh, comments. Um, and uh, but I, I think Mr. Dallal said it well. I, I'm still kind of where I was, and um, I'm still not in support of this proposal. Okay, fair enough. And that's what makes a board. Um, so with that, um, Ms. Bampos, it, 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 as has been the case with the others, it's clear that this application still doesn't have uh, enough support with the board. Um, and I don't know that a further continuance is gonna get the job done before your clock runs out in mid-February since it's almost December or it will be December as far as the calendar goes. So, um, so I, I do have know. a question for you, yeah. Uh, yeah. Chairman Moore. Sure. If, if I withdraw without prejudice, mm -hmm. Does that mean that I, um, with new designs, do I start back with the historic commission or do I start back with ZBA? How does that? If you go? withdraw without prejudice, um, I think the answer is not gonna be as simple as I would like it to be. Um, I'm gonna take a first crack at it and then see if I, if I need help here. Um, if you withdraw without prejudice, you still would have till the 19th to have a building permit from the ZBA. That would entail getting a lot done before then to get into uh, the queue to have the meeting to then say, you know, yay or nay. So um, without prejudice, it's definitely, it's definitely an option and it probably makes sense given the timing of it. Um, if you could somehow get something done in a, in a hurry and get back on to the agenda in time to have a building permit in place by the 19th, um, then you wouldn't have to go back to historic. But if, uh, and unfortunately, I think it would be very difficult to do. And, and that's the case, then it, it goes back to the original way where it goes back to historic. Is that, I, I'm just going to ask um, Caitlin or Jennifer Blanchet, who's listening, does that make sense? Have I misstated that in any way that it's best we can describe this? Hi, Chair, it's Caitlin. That is my understanding. Jennifer, do you agree? Yes, we, we have investigated this and it, it is our understanding um, that the time does expire on that demo delay, the six month time period. There was some question and evaluation as to whether or not that was uh, continued as because of the stay of uh, COVID. Um, but where that was not a permit, it was a delay, it was not believed to have fallen under that protection. Um, that would be, um, so in fact, the, the clock for demo delay would, it is our understanding that it expires on the 19th and it would have to begin again with a brand new demo delay application. Uh, I don't, so I, I don't see any benefit to uh, withdrawing without prejudice with the intent to resubmit to the ZBA. Uh, there, there just, there isn't time. And like the chair had said, uh, it, it would seem to have to take an entirely different project to convince those that are uh, not able to vote in favor of it at this point. Well, the result would be the same if, if, if she withdraws without prejudice or we go to a formal vote and it's no. I mean, the, the, the process would be the same for her. It would, she'd end up back in front of historic or the, or the demo delay process would, would have to. The, 
yes, from a demo delay process, that would still be the same result. The only difference would be that she could return to you, the ZBA, with a similar proposal within a shorter time period, should she desire, if she withdraws without prejudice. If the project is denied this evening, then there is a, uh, del a period of time with which she cannot come back, she or anyone cannot come yeah. back to the board without a substantially different proposal. Thank you. So Ms. Bampos, it appears that, I mean, the best option, and I, again, I, it, it would, it's gonna be um, a long shot would be to withdraw without prejudice versus going to a denial, which would certainly um, seal, seal the deal. Um, I, I, the without prejudice option would at least give you um, a slim chance to, to maybe get something together in time. Okay, so um, our roof line change would still go through historic commission first, yet go through the demo delay and then go to the ZBA. If you didn't get, if, if something wasn't back in front of us and, um, right. and approved before the 19th, yes. Okay, I guess without guidance, I guess my best option is asking for a withdrawal without prejudice so that I can try to figure something out. Um, and that's the, I'm, I, that's the best guidance that, that I could give you without making the final vote tonight and then, and then sealing your fate for two years. Okay. That's what I would like to formally request then. Okay. So we have um, a request by the applicant to withdraw this application without prejudice. Do we have a motion? It's Greg Bennett, I will so move. Uh, Bud Shagan, I'll second it. All right, we have the motion to um, withdraw without prejudice made by Mr. Bennett, second by Mr. Chagnon, Mr. Delisle. Yes. Mr. Swanton? Yes. Mr. Chagnon? Yes. Mr. Benick? Yes. And I am also a yes. That's all uh, yes. Nationally approved. This uh, application is uh, withdrawn without prejudice. Thank you, Ms. Bampos. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, I will be handling uh, handing the virtual gavel back to our esteemed chair, Mr. Champetti. Thank you, Mr. Moore. And uh, continuing where we left off on uh, the next matter uh, on our public hearing list this evening is the application of 2224 Olive Street LLC, care of Lisa Mead, Mead Tellerman and Costa LLC. The address is 2224 Olive Street. Uh, this matter was continued from the meeting of November 9th, 2021, but no, um, no testimony was taken and the application was not formally commenced. So we commence it uh, in its uh, sort of in its initial form this evening if we're to go forward. Um, this is the uh, docket 2021-44 special permit for non-conformities. The applicant seeks all necessary permits uh, required to remove an addition uh, on the rear of the structure and construct a new addition in its place. And for the record, the five voting members uh, on this application will be myself, uh, Mr. Moore, Mr. Delisle, Mr. Swanton, and Mr. Chagman. Uh, with that, um, I will, oh, and I wanna point out also, and this is just procedural, uh, history. The uh, application uh, was um, uh, this this property did go before the Newburyport Historic Commission uh, on a demolition delay application. And I believe that was originally before the Historic Commission on July 22nd, 2021. The uh, the NHC invoked a demolition delay uh, at the most recent um, meeting of October 28th, 2021. Uh, with uh, revised plans and details. The, the uh, Historic Commission, uh, though a split board, um, ultimately voted for uh, yes to no to lift the demolition delay. That is the set of plans that are before us as well uh, this evening. So with that, uh, may we hear from the applicant. Attor I believe we have Attorney Mead uh, presenting as well as uh, Mr. Ernie DeMeo. Uh, Attorney Mead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. And for the record, Lisa Mead made Telemann cost on 30 Green Street in New Report. And as the chair noted, um, we do have with us this evening, uh, Ernie DeMeo of um, Tech Architects. Also with me is uh, John Sarkis, who's the manager of 22 to 24 Olive Street LLC, 
who is my client and the owner of this property. As the chair noted, can you go to the next slide, please? We're here for a modification to a pre-existing non-conforming structure. The property is located in the R2 zoning district. It has a two family use and is a pre-existing non-conforming lot for lot area, secondary front setback and rear setback. And just to um, orient the board, uh, this project, and you'll see in a little bit, is on the corner of Olive Street and Russia Street, Russia Street having the largest frontage. And so uh, Russia Street is actually the front yard primary uh, and the yard opposite that is the rear yard. The R2 district requires 15,000 square feet for a two family. The property includes 10,758 square feet of area. The secondary front setback uh, is required to be 25 feet and the property includes 10.6 feet on Olive Street, which is the technical front of the house. The rear or opposite of Russia Street has required to have a setback of 25 feet and the property includes 16.5 feet. There are um, currently two parking spaces on the property and in the existing condition, you are supposed to have four. Um, the DCOD is not triggered um, because they're removing less than 25% of the existing walls. However, as uh, the chair noted, uh, the applicant has been before for several months, the historic commission uh, and the historic commission did approve uh, the revised plans that the board has before it this evening and has had for about a month. Um, the uh, historic commission also did a site visit as part of their work on this project. Next slide, please. So what I'd like to do is kind of walk the, uh, the board around the house before I go into this a little bit more and turn it over to Ernie. But here are the existing conditions of the house. So you see the Russia Street elevation on the left um, top corner, uh, the uh, Olive Street elevation on the right top corner, and then the existing north elevation on the bottom left. Uh, that's adjacent to the, uh, the only neighbor there on Olive Street. And then the rear elevation, which you see if you were traveling uh, south on, uh, or east, excuse me, on Russia Street. Next slide, please. And here is a, a photo of the corner of Olive and uh, Russia Street. Uh, you'll note that this house has a hip roof, uh, no third floor, uh, which makes it actually a smaller, at least in stature, uh, than several of the surrounding homes, not the, not the least of which is the two immediately adjacent to it, um, which both have gable ends and uh, third floor space. I don't know if that's living space or not on those units, but in fact, uh, um, you can see that this kind of sits on the corner of Olive Street and with the hip roof, it uh, does perform in a uh, shorter manner, so to speak. Next slide, please. And this is if you're traveling uh, east on Russia Street, uh, you'll see that there's that building right now that we're proposing to take down, which is a workshop. Um, once that building is taken down, you'll actually be able to see more of the exposed rear of the house or side yard of the house um, and the original structure. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute too, but that building is proposed to be taken down and actually the, the historic structure will stand more proud on the property as a result of that. Next slide, please. And then here's uh, coming up Olive Street towards High Street. Um, you can just see another view. Next slide, please. And here's the rear yard. This is a um, this is an older addition, uh, one that was more original to the structure, um, but an addition nonetheless. Next slide, please. And then you can see both additions on the back. Those will both be proposed to be removed and more of that exterior wall re-exposed, including a couple of original openings. Next slide, please. And then this is the uh, newer side of the addition um, that exists. Uh, I'll just note here for a minute um, that once these come down, uh, the new addition is proposed to be actually set in uh, much further from the, um, the side walls than the proposed, than the existing conditions. Next slide, please. Next, thank you. So the proposal is to uh, remove the uh, later added rear additions. 
Um, as I noted, we worked extensively with the Historic Commission and received their release of the demo delay at their October 28th meeting. Uh, the addition creates no new nonconformities, nor does it extend or exacerbate any existing nonconformities. The addition is more than 500 square feet, and that is why we are before the board. Uh, it improves the current site conditions. The proposed the site will have five parking spaces where four are required and it currently has two. The primary set front setback off of Russia Street will be improved and the lot coverage will decrease from 24.7% to 24.5%. Next slide, please. And I think you can really just, uh, if you could blow up the actual footprint um, a little bit, Caitlin, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so the darker line is the addition in this instance. Um, thank you very much. So you can see the lighter hash lines of the existing additions that are gonna be removed uh, and the proposed new addition, which is obviously smaller in footprint, um, including width uh, than the existing home. Um, will be added within all of the setbacks. Uh, you can see that from the um, technical rear setback, it's uh, 29.6 feet, uh, where 25 feet are required, and certainly uh, further away than the existing addition. Uh, it's 30 feet from the uh, right side, which is technically a side yard. Uh, and then you can see that it's uh, a little over 26 feet off of uh, Russia Street, which is an improvement of the current setback, as you can see, which is 25.1 feet. Um, so I, I think that this um, site plan helps to orient everybody where the proposed addition will go. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ernie, who is going to walk through the architectural plans. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, my name is Ernest Cuneo. I'm the owner of Tectonics Architects in Salem. We're the architects for the project. Uh, here we can see the uh, proposed uh, south and east elevations of the project. The south elevation above represents a view, a flat on view of the building along Russia Street. The original 1830s building is to the right. We're uh, connecting to that building with what the um, Secretary of the Interior refers to as a hyphen. Uh, and then we have the, the, the bulk of the addition is to the left which has been expressed um, as contrasting brick in the elevation. The hyphen connector to the original building is set lower in height than the existing historic roof. We lowered the floor elevations of the addition such that we could tuck the new roof of the hyphen below the existing roof line so we're not overlaying the historic roof. And uh, there's a single door on Russia Street, which enters a common vestibule, which exits to the left and to the right into entry foyers, uh, mudroom spaces for each of the units. Uh, unit one, which is in the brick structure is to the left and the uh, original historic building enters to the right. The space on the second floor of the hyphen is actually dedicated to the brick unit on the left. Architecturally, we treated it similar to the first floor so that the hyphen was accentuated and the, and the connection uh, was clear between the um, original building and the addition, which is uh, making it visually separate from the original structure, uh, which is an important uh, point in the Secretary of the Interior guidelines, not to have a unification of the entire structure as a whole, but rather than to uh, treat them as separate expressions architecturally. Um, uh, the hyphen, the use of the hyphen is consistent with uh, some of the examples given in the Secretary of the Interior. And we believe we've uh, done well to keep our roof below the existing historic roof, roof line. The elevation below of the east elevation on Olive Street shows uh, no substantial change. There are um, brick chimneys that you can see on the original building that are uh, existing. The uh, brick chimneys that are closest to Olive Street uh, will be will remain there in good condition. The chimneys that are closer to the addition will be re reconstructed to match the original chimneys because they're in a state of uh, disrepair and they're structurally unsound. 
Uh, next slide, please. The two views that you see here, uh, the north elevation is the upper elevation. This is the elevation facing our abutting neighbor at 20 Olive. And the elevation below is the west, what we're calling the west elevation, which is the view that you might see driving along uh, Russia Street, coming down the street, the, uh, the narrow uh, facade facing towards our, what would be our side yard, and the upper elevation facing towards what would be our rear yard. Um, you can see in um, our profile photo to the right of the actual images how the how the addition sits virtually centered on the lot. So most of the mass occupies the very center of the lot uh, with a substantial amount of open space uh, surrounding all three sides of the addition. The uh, windows of the addition uh, closest to our our neighbor at 6 Russia Street um, pick up on the window patterning from the uh, original building. And then as we move around towards what is the backside of the addition, uh, the windows um, are more related to the interior functions, which are more uh, service oriented on this side of the building. Um, Lisa alluded to the fact that um, this portion of the building is set back significantly further than the existing one story additions that we're removing. Uh, we're actually setting the building back an additional um, um, nearly uh, 12 feet, slightly more than 12 feet from uh, 20 Olive Street. Uh, next slide, please. This is a view um, along Olive Street, and you can see in the very background on the right side, a portion of the addition uh, peeking out through uh, the space between 20 Olive and our unit. Uh, there's a very brief window where the building would be observed from Olive Street, um, but it's not the entire facade of the addition. It's mainly the far uh, right side body of the addition that would be seen, the actual hyphen uh, would not be seen from Olive Street from any of any public vantage point. Uh, next slide, please. This is a view uh, from the opposite side of the street in front of, uh, let's say, 29 Olive Street, looking towards the corner of Olive and Russia. You can see our addition in the background and the historic 1830s building in the foreground. Our connector is set back uh, from the from Russia Street far enough that from this vantage point, you can't even see the facade of the hyphen from this vantage point. Uh, in fact, the brick facade is also set back from the historic facade. So every facade on the addition is uh, set back from the uh, original building, which is uh, set proud as, as we intended to celebrate. Next slide, please. This is a view from uh, Russia Street, looking back toward Olive Street, if you will. You can see our addition in the foreground, uh, window uh, details and patterning uh, of similar rhythm to the original building. Then we have our hyphen, which uh, separates the two masses. Uh, the two windows that uh, appear on the return in the shadow on the uh, existing 1830s building, uh, one of those windows, the first floor window, is currently concealed within a wall in the existing building, and we're going to restore that uh, window as part of this work. Um, in fact, um, as just as a point of reference, the existing one-story additions cover approximately 62% of that west facade of the historic building, which is fairly substantial, and the addition that we're proposing with the hyphen um, covers that rear facade uh, approximately 35%. So we're exposing an additional 257 square feet of historic original facade and claiming uh, two more historic windows that have been covered up by previous additions. So um, we're covering less of the facade, we're setting the addition back further, 
um, and this will actually enhance the views of the original building. Um, as you can see, the roof line of the addition is set lower. The ridge of the addition is set significantly lower, almost eight feet lower than the existing building, uh, which as Lisa mentioned, you can see um, the roof line of 20 Olive peaking out from above our addition. The roof line of 20 Olive is substantially taller than even the original 1830s building, and we're seven feet lower than that. Next slide, please. This is the aerial view of the site that I alluded to. Um, as, as mentioned, the addition confines itself towards the center of the lot, um, giving back much of the open space that's been created. Um, interestingly, uh, the present lot coverage on the site uh, has been reduced in the final uh, build out. Uh, presently, the existing lot has a lot coverage of 24.7%. That includes the one-story buildings and the workshop, which we are demolishing. And we're proposing a lot coverage of 24.5%. So not only are we moving the built form further away from our neighbors and from the street, but we're also actually reducing the total amount of lot coverage with the build-out. The um, existing workshop is set back from Russia Street approximately 7.8 feet. The closest point of our addition to Russia Street will now be 26.3 feet. So that's uh, nearly a 20 foot uh, further setback than structure that exists currently. And uh, relative to uh, 6 Russia Street, which is the abutter to the left in this drawing, we're increasing the setback to building structure from 5 feet to 30 feet. Uh, so uh, we're giving back a fair amount of open space and air to our abutting neighbors and to the streets with the approach that we're taking. Uh, we're uh, also, as I mentioned, increasing the distance between any structure on the backside of this building to 20 Olive Street from 17 feet to 29.6 feet. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm sorry, this, this view is really just to show uh, what the trees in their actual fullness are. Uh, the previous slide uh, faded the trees so that you could actually see the open space and the built form uh, that we were proposing. Uh, this shows the trees more realistically to what they are so that you can get a feel for uh, how the masses relate to the streetscape. Uh, next slide, please. This slide um, is basically informational. It gives all the dimensions of the footprint of the existing building and the proposed addition. I think um, important to Lisa's comments is how the setback lines, which are the diagonals closest to the building and in the case of the original building cutting through the building, uh, shows how we respect all the existing required uh, front setback, rear setback, side yard setback, um, overall lot coverage, building height, so forth. We're not creating any new nonconformities and we're not extending any existing nonconformities. Um, next slide, please. So I think with that, Ernie, I'll, I'll take it back for a little bit, okay? All right, so um, thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna run through the special permit criteria. Um, as Ernie and I have uh, said ad nauseum now that we will not be creating any new nonconformities, uh, nor will we be exacerbating any existing nonconformities. So uh, the first criteria, of course, under section nine is that there will be no new nonconformities created and here there will be none. Uh, the next is that the proposed change will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the pre-existing non-conforming structure or use. Here, as we have said, the proposed addition is smaller in footprint and overall square footage and height than the existing structure is. The lot has sufficient size as compared to neighboring lots to accommodate the proposed addition. Um, also, the proposal to, to remove the two additions uh, that were not appropriate to the original historic structure and to re-expose a significant portion of that rear of that structure and move the additions away from 
uh, both the rear and the side lot line. Uh, the proposal also, um, as I noted, removes the non-conforming workshop um, and removes the existing additions and exposes uh, the windows as well as the brick um, on the property. Next slide, please. Um, additionally, the proposed modifications are appropriate to the scale, massing, and architectural style of the existing home. Um, as Ernie pointed out, uh, if you compare the density of the property as proposed, it's in the middle to the less dense side of other properties in the neighborhood on a comparative basis. Um, the lot is the only corner lot on Olive Street with complying primary front um, setbacks, that is off of the Russia Street side. The lot has an open feel around all sides, as Ernie has said, and the proposed addition, especially on Russia Street uh, portion, as well as having low lot coverage for this neighborhood due to its remaining space and dimensional conformities. Um, further, uh, the, the uh, proposal is compliant with the Secretary of the Interior standards. Um, before I go into that, I, I would just tell you, um, because I know the board's gonna ask this momentarily anyway, the total square footage of all new construction is 1,984 square feet, but we're demolishing 4,900, excuse me, 493 square feet of existing floor area. So the net difference is 1,491 square feet um, on a lot that is 10,758 square feet. Um, next slide, please. Um, further, the lot coverage on the property decreases, as we've noted. Uh, Ernie also noted the uh, 270 square foot additional facade of that rear wall will be exposed. Um, the proposed addition also allows the historic building to retain its interior features with only minor modifications, um, which is really beneficial to be able to retain uh, the interior historic features of the house as well. Um, and it's not going to be substantially more detrimental than existing non-conforming structures we've noted. Next slide, please. Lisa, may I cut in for one second, please? Sure, sure. Ernie. Thank you, thank you, I apologize. Um, I, I neglected to mention Lisa's point that she just mentioned about the, um, the uh, just the strategy that we're taking. Uh, obviously this was an important discussion in the Historic Commission review. Uh, we uh, painstakingly to not only refrain from doing any harm to the existing building, but we've tried to expose and restore as much of the original exterior as we could with the design approach that we're taking. But furthermore, I think it's important to, you know, really emphasize Lisa's point that um, Mr. Coulter John mentioned in the last presentation um, timber structures and how altering timber structures. Um, is tricky because uh, those structures, uh, it's, it's really the combination of all the members working together that gives a structure its integrity. And this is a timber frame structure. And um, the, the challenge of putting an addition on this building, if we would have taken a different approach and built a slightly smaller addition, we would have ended up having to do a lot more uh, reworking of the interior of this building. Um, although the building is an absolutely beautiful structure, which we uh, greatly admire, uh, we uh, did not want to uh, tear apart the interiors of this building in order to make a two-family unit that uh, does not comply in any way with current codes or access or egress or even uh, current um, standards uh, in the in today's real estate world, uh, we would have had to substantially gut the existing building to make it a successful two-unit building today. And uh, quite honestly, uh, we've tried very hard to retain as much of the plaster and wainscoting and stairs and window treatments and moldings and trim and exposed wood as possible. And this approach that we're taking here by taking um, an approach of putting uh, an addition uh, to the exterior uh, allows us to retain as much of the interior as possible. We'd like to pass this building on to future generations and have it be substantially similar to the way it's always been. And this 
approach, uh, we believe, is uh, the best opportunity for maximum preservation. Uh, I'm sorry, Lisa, back to you. Oh, thank you very much, Ernie. Um, I appreciate it. And it's a nice segue into my next um, comment. So I understand that the board and um, Mr. Swanton is gonna appreciate my comments here in a minute that um, you, you, know, you, you don't apply the Secretary of the Interior standards, but you're gonna hear maybe uh, from some folks relative to the historic nature of the area. Um, and certainly this house um, is historic. And so it was important for the Historic Commission um, as well as the applicant to make sure that it does in fact um, meet the standards relative to additions on um, new construction on historic structures. And so um, just generally, I'm gonna go through those because I think it's important to note that the addition is subordinate in every way. And you can see that on, on all of the plans uh, and the um, renderings that we've provided. It's not the same height as the original structure and it's all, also more narrow and smaller in square footage. Uh, the addition um, may be removed in the future, not impair the essential form and integrity of the original structure. Uh, indeed, as I've noted over and over again, we're actually restoring more of the exterior wall than exists today. Uh, the removal of the later added additions uh, will expose that wall and the original windows. Uh, the new addition is visually separate from the original structure, and that's accomplished through both uh, materials as well as the hyphen that Ernie has talked about. And the addition size, rhythm, and alignment of the uh, windows and door openings reflect that of the original. So I just I wanted to go through those because I think it's I think it's important um, in this particular proposal. Next slide, please. Um, the next thing I want to point out is that um, the lot in the middle is um, 22 to 24 Olive Street, um, and you'll see that it has a significant area and open space on it. Um, and that's important because as you look up and down Olive Street, um, generally speaking, there are no other um, lots that have that amount of open space on them. Um, certainly back on the corner of Merrill and Russia Street, there's a multifamily house that sits back on that corner. It has uh, some open space, um, but really no, no other lot has the same amount of open space. Um, that this lot has if you remove all of the outbuildings and the uh, current additions, um, or even after the proposed addition is put on it. Um, most of the lots are non-conforming for lot coverage. Uh, right across the street on Russia Street, um, that lot that also faces Russia Street doesn't even have the 25 foot front setback um, off of Russia Street that this lot has, and I pointed that out a little while ago. Um, so we've provided to you, as you, I just, I think this visual is important. We've provided to you that um, if you compare this property as proposed to the surrounding area by footprint of the structures, uh, finished area density per 10,000 square feet or finished area per 10,000 square feet, the proposal is in the middle or the less dense side as compared to the rest of this neighborhood. Uh, and I think that um, that's important because, you, you know, you're going to hear and you may have gotten some letters relative to the size of this addition, but the size of the addition meets zoning uh, in all dimensional respects um, and clearly is less dense on its lot than most all other um, structures on Olive Street, either the short end of Olive Street, Olive Street to High, or if you go all the way from, um, or Olive Street to Washington, or if, all, if you go all the way down to Merrimack Street. And I thought that that was um, important to note. So um, with that, um, I, don't, I think you can go to the next slide. I think, and then those are the comparisons we provided to the board. Uh, you can see that the finished area per 10,000 square feet is uh, this is on the short section of Olive Street, the immediate neighborhood um, is 4,657. This is the last column to the right that we provided to the board. Uh, and you can see that it falls right in the middle, <clears throat> excuse me, of the finished area per 10,000 square feet on the immediate neighborhood. Uh, the columns under finished area to the left third of this uh, slide, is the actual finished area as it as opposed to a comparison of 10,000 square feet. And again, you can see that um, 
the finished area is also, um, while it's a little bit on the higher side, um, it's not, those lots are all much smaller than the lot that we have on Olive Street. If you can go to the next slide, please. And then if you compare it to the neighborhood overall, um, it also falls right in the middle. Of, if you compare it on a per lot area, 10,000 square feet basis, um, it falls in the middle because of the size of the lot. So with that, um, I think that uh, we'd request the board issue a special permit for non-conformities. Um, the architectural style, size and design of the proposed renovated property is appropriate for the neighborhood and certainly not more sub not substantially more detrimental um, than the current pre-existing non-conforming structure. Thank you. Lisa, I wanted to add uh, just a couple of more points if I could. Um, regarding, the, uh, regarding the lot itself, um, uh, across Olive Street from our uh, property is 29 Olive Street. Um, 29 Olive Street is the largest building in the immediate area. It has six units in it as opposed to our two. And those six units cover 62% of its site. We cover approximately 24% of our site. Um, 29 Olive Street has 50% more floor area in that building than we're proposing for our lot, um, 7337. And what's interesting about that figure, the 7337 of the building across the street is that number closely compares to the amount of open space that we're proposing on our lot. We have approximately um, 7,025 square feet of open space that are being proposed in our plan. That amount of open space is almost as large as the floor area of the largest building in the neighborhood across the street. And in fact, that 7,025 square feet is larger than virtually every other lot in this neighborhood. If you take the size of the lot that's in the accompanying diagrams and you look at the size of, for example, um, 28 Olive Street, just pick one randomly, the size of that lot is 3,490 square feet. We have twice as much open space on our lot as that lot has lot area. So I think when you consider the size of our lot and the proposal, I think we're in keeping with the scale of the neighborhood. In fact, we have significantly more area open on our site relative to the size of our lot than most other lots do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, was there anything else, uh, Attorney Mead or Mr. DeMeo? Not at this time. Thank you. Great. No, I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Mead. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. DeMeo, for that presentation. Uh, with that, I'll close the uh, presentation portion of the public hearing, and we will go to um, the public comment section, and I'll ask uh, uh, Ms. Sullivan to go ahead. Yes. Uh, could I just break in for one moment? Uh, course, it, it, was my, it was my intention to recuse myself from this matter, and I realized I had neglected to do so only after Attorney Mead had uh, begun her presentation. Uh, so uh, I will recuse myself from this matter. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Delisle. And so with that recusal of Mr. Delisle, allow me to restate the five voting members uh, for this application are myself, uh, Mr. Moore, Mr. Swanton, Mr. Channon, and Mr. Benick. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, we will um, uh, go ahead and open the uh, second portion of the public hearing, which is the public comment section. I'll ask Ms. Sullivan uh, if you could put up the, uh, I see it there, the slide for uh, instructions for public comment. Uh, members of the public uh, in attendance, just feel free to raise your hand by uh, clicking the uh, bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, raise your hand, you'll be recognized, and uh, we'll just ask you to unmute your mic. Please try to keep your comments to within two minutes and uh, just give your name and address for Ms. Joy, our keeper of the record. So um, I see uh, Michael Tucker, and, uh, and Mr. Tucker, if you want to go ahead and unmute your mic, uh, we'll recognize you and you, uh, you have the floor. Good morning. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair. Uh, honorable members, this is Bill Sheehan. I'm using Mike Tucker's computer. Uh, Mike is with me tonight. Uh, and I represent Carol Zamprona, 20 Olive Street in Newburyport. Uh, Ms. Zamprona faces what is described by the architect 
as the north elevation of the proposed structure. The proposed structure, simply put, is massive. It is totally out of character with the size of the neighborhood dwellings. It has over 5,000 square feet of finished area, is almost twice as big as the next largest house, and over three times the size of many of the dwelling units in the neighborhood. Uh, I hope that the board has uh, available to it um, a, a property information outline, which we presented today, uh, care of Mr. Port to the board, together with some photographs. I'd inquire of Caitlin whether you have those. Hi, we do, um, we do not have those as Mr. Port um, is on vacation this week. All right, well, let me, let me then summarize what is in the table uh, because there was a reference at the conclusion of the applicant's uh, presentation. Uh, there was a discussion about 29 Olive Street. Uh, when you look at the other 14 properties on Olive Street and uh, Russia Street that are in the immediate neighborhood of the subject property, what you will see uh, is finished area that ranges from 1,088 square feet to 2,590 square feet. And please keep in mind that the existing structure at 2224 Olive Street is now 3,567 square feet, and it is proposed to exceed over 5,000 square feet. So you can see that uh, this proposed structure is totally out of character with the size of the uh, neighborhood dwellings. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Zamprona's home is about a dozen paces from what has been referred to as the addition. Uh, and I asked the board to note that what is called the addition is really, it's a second dwelling. Uh, it's attached to the existing structure by a hyphen uh, so as to avoid the ordinance's recent prohibition of two separate dwellings on a single non-conforming lot. The, both the lot and the structure are presently non-conforming. The lot simply is too small for a two family uh, by nearly one third. The structure is now too close to Olive Street. It's too close to my client's property. The applicant nonetheless is asking you to allow a huge increase in finished area on a lot containing far fewer square feet than required by zoning. The applicant is also asking you to allow construction of a structure that will have a height of some 24 to 25 feet for a length of some 85 feet facing my client's house, when presently my client is looking at a 24 foot high section um, of the structure, which is now only 38 feet in length. There is an enormously negative impact on my client uh, with respect to the proposed structure. The applicant is proposing to more than double the length of the two story wall, which will block all light and air from the desirable Southwest to my client's property. And where the existing wall is already too close to my client's home and is non-conforming. While technically the lot coverage has not increased because of the removal of some low slung out buildings, the replacement of those scattered buildings with the enormous two-story addition results in a huge increase in massing detrimental to my client and to the neighborhood. There has been a discussion about how many uh, square feet of finished area there are per 10,000 square feet. That, with all due respect, is not really the question here. The question is not so much whether the house is too big for the lot, but whether the, the house as proposed is too big for the neighborhood. The answer is obviously yes. It is two houses in one with over 5,000 square feet of finished area, so much larger than any other property in the neighborhood other than a building which houses six condominium units. Uh, the applicant's proposed structure will choke off light, it will choke off air and overcrowd the existing non-conforming lot. In a case very similar to uh, involving a zoning ordinance, very similar to uh, the zoning ordinance of Newburyport, the Supreme Judicial Court has relatively recently weighed in uh, in, the, in the Bransford case. In the Bransford case, 
uh, the applicant proposed to increase 1,250 square feet of living area to 2,300 square feet, which would increase by, which would uh, exceed by more than 500 square feet uh, the average structure with a footprint addition of 200 square feet on a 22,000 square foot lot. That Bransford case, Bransford case, uh, case resulted in uh, reduced open space on the lot, increased density of the neighborhood, and the court affirmed a denial of a 40A section six special permit, just as is being requested here. We have 3,567 square feet increased to over 5,000 square feet and much more uh, by way of excess over the average structure in the neighborhood, much more than the 500 square feet as in Bransford. In addition, the footprint addition here is five times what was suggested in Bransford. It's 1,992 square feet on a lot half the size of the lot in the Supreme Judicial Court case that I'm referring. Here as there, the reduction in area not covered by a two-story structure, the increased density, the loss of light and air, all adds up to a proposed structure, which is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing structure. And therefore in the discretion of this board, the board should deny the requested special permit. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Attorney Sheehan. Um, recognizing uh, now uh, Amy Badger. Um, Ms. Badger, if you want to uh, unmute your mic, you have the floor. Please just give your name and address for our, uh, our record keeper, please. Uh, yes, I'm Amy Badger, and I'm a 30 year, 30 plus year resident of 21 Olive Street, which is across the street from the home that we are discussing. Um, and I use the word home. Uh, specifically because it is a stately old home, which is really kind of the, the jewel of Olive Street. Um, and it's got a fairly modest backyard. It's not a terribly spacious backyard, but it's proportional to the context of the other neighbors and their yards. Um, and for such a big house, it's actually kind of a modest yard. But what's being proposed here um, I just want to remember that this is a backyard we're talking about, and this is not a piece of land to develop. Um, this house as it is right now would be a gem restored by someone who would want it as a stately single family home. But if that's not the case, it never made it to the market. So uh, it's, it's zoned for two family. And the current square footage of nearly 4,000 square feet um, allows for two quite livable units that are actually in much more keeping with the neighborhood and it adds no hulking structure. Um, the numbers to me seem fuzzy and I, I, I don't need it explained tonight, but I, to be taking away some one story garden sheds and kitchen additions and replacing them with two story uh, buildings and say this is a comparison, a comparable um, trade-off. It just isn't when it comes to the light and the um, and the uh, area. Um, but by adding a whole separate house in the backyard, the property becomes much more valuable only to the developer and certainly not to the neighborhood. Um, we've been told throughout the or at the historic committee what. The developer is allowed to do by right and i guess i'm asking the committee what rights do we have the neighbors the abutters the community members what do we do when we're faced with this kind of development um, by allowing this project to move forward the neighbors the neighborhood and i think the whole town pay the price while only the developer benefits and we're left with more cars and density and less light, less trees, less green space. Um, and there's only a downside to this already densely populated neighborhood. Um, I believe this is called infill and we're seeing it all over town and here it is on Olive Street. So if we don't have rules and laws within our city organizations to control this kind of infill, 
And what I feel like is kind of a disregard for the quality of life for the people who live here. Uh, may I ask how, other than this forum, do we address this issue? Um, I appreciate your time and consideration of this particular issue, but also of how your consideration will impact our neighborhoods and the rest of the community overall. I obviously oppose this size and the scale of this project, and I think it could be done in a much more modest way within an, the existing structure and become wholly acceptable for the neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Badger. Uh, recognizing Micah Donahue. Um, uh, Micah Donahue, Donahue, if you want to uh, kindly uh, unmute your mic and uh, you have the floor. And I, I will ask, uh, though, of course, we're exercising, I, I have the ability to exercise discretion and, and have been and will continue to. But do please um, uh, respect the courtesy of, of the two minute rule. We do ask that you try to compress your thoughts and comments as best you can, uh, certainly within reason. And uh, this way we can have ample time to make sure that we hear from everyone. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, Micah Donahue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Micah Donahue at 16 Olive Street, I'm two doors down. Um, I'm one of the um, uh, folks that would be impacted and um, in the neighborhood by um, such a large structure taking up what is um, a, as, as Amy said, a real gem on Olive Street. This house is far more visible than other um, homes on Olive Street. It is. Um, because of that corner lot, because of the current open space around it, um, it has a, a much larger presence um, than some of the others. Um, I would agree that the it would seem the board's job here um, is not to able not being able to change the past to help improve the future. Um, you have, you know, heard from a variety of, um, you know, perspectives. The the nature of the neighborhood and the percentage of, of coverage. And I would say that this particular property has, um, you know, uh, needs a, a special protection toward that end of preserving the space and, and size of the neighborhood. Um, a couple just quick, quick points of clarification. Um, number one, we have not, the abutters, the lawyer um, that Carol hired have not had a chance, adequate chance to review um, the measurements of the property. Those were only submitted to my knowledge today or seen publicly today. Um, we, you know, we don't think that the board would have had substantial time to review those either. Um, and we also question um, the amount of parking added to the lot where there are two spaces, um, two lots, two parking areas noted as nine by 18 feet, um, but are supposed to accommodate two cars each. Um, I don't see that how that's possible. Um, it seems like there might be uh, a continuance suggested to uh, allow time to review the measurements and to correct um, those parking areas if they are in error. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Donahue. Um, and uh, before I, I go further, um, uh, Caitlin, is there a part of this application that was just submitted today? Uh, there appears to be um, a slide in the presentation that includes measurements of the walls. Um, so that's new. Okay, so the it's walls. just that, that slide. Yeah. And I'm assuming the um, whatever calculus is contained on that slide with the measurements. Um, that was what's... That's right. Yep, the last few pages are new as well. Very good. Um, all right. Um, and uh, if I can ask Attorney Sheehan, if you don't mind just uh, just lowering your hand so that we'll we'll be able to see uh, who's uh, who still has yet to be recognized. I appreciate that. Uh, I will recognize uh, the next hand. It's uh, just listed on our attendees list as uh, Jer L, um, J E R capital L. If uh, you could unmute your mic, uh, you have the floor. I'm sorry, uh, we, um, we can't hear you if you wanna just click the microphone icon on the bottom left of your screen. Uh, you'll see that there's a red line through it and it should go green when you click it. We'll, uh, we'll circle back to, um, we'll circle back to JRL. Uh, 
Hello, ma'am. I, I can see you on uh, the Zoom screen. If um, your mute, your microphone is muted. If you don't mind uh, the bottom left of your screen, clicking the uh, the microphone icon should enable it and uh, unmute your mic. There you go. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, ma'am. And if you could just give your name and address for our uh, for our keeper of the minutes. Okay, my name is Carol Rouleau. I'm at a butter on 26 Olive Street. Thank you, Ms. Rouleau. You have uh, you have the floor. And you can hear me because I can't hear you. Uh, um, yes, we can hear you. You can. I, are you? You do you not hear me now. Of scale, appearance, and appropriateness are being overridden by what can be done to this property to make more profit and avoid zoning permits. Hopefully the improvements to the exterior of the historic house will be honored. Um, but it seems like there's been a change of strategy. What used to be a mudroom pass through is now being called a hyphen. But the bottom line is almost 2000 square feet of a structure is being added. And the open spaces, including four parking spaces off of Russia Street, and I couldn't find dimensions. But the prior owners had tandem spots off of Olive Street, and I don't know why that's not being acknowledged or the gate being moved to accommodate larger vehicles. But um, I don't think a two family needs six spaces. Um, tandem parking is so commonplace in the city of Newburyport. I don't know why it's not an option and why forced vehicles have to be backing up to the narrow end of Russia Street. Uh, I'm not trying to be negative. I was really looking forward to this property being cleaned up and getting nice neighbors. I'm just tired of seeing uh, money talk and regulations um, being put in place to the detriment of the neighborhood. Um, so I realize like there are no controls, no ordin ordinances and you, no one can predict who the future buyer will be. But I do hope that everyone look, re-looks at the parking situation and also the size of the structure. And it's basically an infill in the backyard. I mean, that's been sacrificed. So I thank you for your time and your thoughts, but um, we'll see where this goes. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, if uh, um, if we can uh, move on to our next uh, our next uh, attendee, um, we'll recognize Elizabeth Hallett. Uh, Ms. Hallett, you uh, you have the floor, and just kindly uh, just unmute your mic, please, and give your name and address uh, for the record. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, my name is Elizabeth Hallett. 23 Olive Street. Um, Thank you. We can hear you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we are 13 year residents here on Olive Street. And uh, 20, 20 and 22 is, is really a, a gem, um, as they were, as my neighbors were saying, on Olive Street. And part of what makes um, this property attractive is the open space in the backyard. As we all know, it is an historic structure, um, which used to be the old ladies home uh, as so-called in Newburyport. And uh, without that open space around it, it just loses its import as, as that um, sort of historic structure. Um, certainly the size and scale um, are detrimental to our area, um, to this neighborhood the pre-existing non-conforming structures, uh, one-story structures um, either attached to the uh, older home or the shed or the garden shed on the property. 
um, are certainly not uh, do not interfere with the the air and light movement in the, the on the property and in the neighborhood. Um, whereas this large two story uh, bulky structure will certainly impair the view of you know the back of this historic home, um, as well as as the view viewscapes from uh, Russia Street and Olive Street. And uh, it, it just does not fit. It's, it's just simply too large and out of place and is in fact uh, what we all are um, calling infill in Newburyport. It's part of, part of that. Um, and another point with all the exterior uh, sheds and so forth removed from the property, where will these homeowners store their lawnmowers, snowblowers, perhaps bicycles, et cetera? Um, and then will they then request a uh, shed construction to follow uh, for somewhere to store these, these sorts of items. Um, the parking again is another issue for us. Um, at our home at 23 Olive, we do not have a driveway as many people do not on Olive Street. And as a lot of us know, um, tandem parking is not always convenient. Many people will just rather park on the street than go out and move a vehicle that's parked in tandem for the front vehicle to, to be able to move and therefore taking up parking places that are needed by those of us who do not even have a driveway. So the addition of all these parking places, um, particularly on narrow Russia Street where two cars cannot pass um, is, is just ridiculous in my opinion. Um, uh, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Hallett. Um, I'll recognize uh, next uh, Ms. Carol Zampragna. Uh, Ms. Zampragna, you uh, you have the floor. Just unmute your mic and kindly just give your name and address uh, for uh, for Ms. Joy, our record keeper. Thank you very much. This is Carol Zampragna, 20 Olive Street. I'm the direct abutter to this property. Attorney Sheehan uh, opened our, our conversation, so I will keep it fairly brief. I do wanna note that some of the pictures, uh, especially slides 12 and 13, which show the east and west elevations, seem to have erased my house and replaced them with a very large oak tree. It's making the property look much more spacious and wide open than it is without my home uh, existing where it does. So just wanted to call out those slides. As attorney Sheehan has called out, I'm not looking to live next to two dwellings, which really are two conjoined masses. The historic architecture experts at the Newburyport Preservation Trust have opposed this project from the beginning. Keep in mind, it was a split decision by the Newburgh Historical Commission. So although they did approve it, there were at least two members that voted against and others that expressed concerns. The direct of others, including myself, others in the neighborhood you've heard from tonight have all spoken up in opposition. Uh, I was a member of your ZBA meeting on July the 27th. And if you recall, there was a pretty lengthy debate about a project at 86 to 88 Prospect Street um, many of the members of this committee seem to have pretty big concerns with the design, but stated that since there were no community objections on massing and scale, they didn't have a reason to vote against it. And the comment was that not a single neighbor had called or written in to complain. So using that same logic, you've heard from myself, from Liz, from Carol, from Micah, from Amy, and there may still be others waiting to speak. they are all neighbors speaking up to oppose the mass and scale of this building and the change to this beautiful historic structure. So I hope following the same guidelines that you used in July, that you were listening and hearing the, the objection to a building of this size on this lot. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sampragna. Uh, moving uh, to uh, recognize next, next uh, Mr. Stephen Bodich. Uh, Mr. Bodich, if you wouldn't kindly uh, unmute your mic and give your name and address and you have the floor. Okay, sure, can you hear me? We can, sir. Yes. Okay. Yes. My name is Steve Bouch. Uh, I live at 21 Olive Street. I've lived here for a little over 21 years um, as a uh, an adjacent, not a directly adjacent, but across the street, a butter. We look at this house uh, really as the anchor of Lower Olive Street. It is uh, definitely has historical and architectural significance. And as many of the other speakers have said tonight, it has character on Lower Olive that draws the eye to it. It's a beautiful backyard. And to fill that backyard, not a back, not a lot, but as my, uh, as Amy Badger said, the backyard, to fill that backyard 
with nearly 20, nearly 2,000 square feet of additional structure seems absurd. It's just too massive for the space. Um, I also think that it will have a significant impact on the light and air as we all look at that area uh, as the sun sets. Uh, to look at that sunset now with a large massive house in the middle of it seems absurd. Um, <clears throat> there have been comments about the parking as well. I think the fact that two new curb cuts with parking spaces of those dimensions seems uh, inadequate for what are likely to be several Tahoes, Escalades, and Suburbans that were pulling into that area. I wonder how these large vehicles will navigate the narrow Russia Street when the snow banks are piled high and visibility is restricted quite poorly, I suspect. Um, <clears throat> I, in closing, I'd like to say simply that the, uh, over the past six months, I've listened to many comments uh, from the Historical Commission as we've progressed through this on this project. And um, I have heard exclusively negative comments from the abutters. I have not heard a single comment in support of this. And I think that speaks volumes to the one, the neighborhood position, but also the lack of support for this type of construction in this neighborhood at this time. I just think that should be brought to, better, uh, brought to your attention as well. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vodich. Um, and uh, recognizing uh, the next hand, Mr. Thomas Coulterjohn. Uh, Mr. Coulterjohn, uh, you have the floor. Hello, can you hear me? We can, sir. Thank you. Tom Coulterjohn, 64 Federal Street, co-president of the Newburyport Preservation Trust. The trust opposes this project in its current form. It needs to be reduced significantly in size it will have a negative impact on this historic neighborhood. The current house sits on a corner lot and as such is a very dominant and highly visible part of the streetscape and the neighborhood. The massing and sheer size and scale of this proposed building detracts from the neighboring houses. If it were in a different neighborhood surrounded by large lots, it would be another matter altogether. It could be a pleasing design, but not here. This proposal distorts the corner lot to become more dominant, so much so that it becomes intrusive. Pretty visual pictures of how it is intended to look when completed do not do the impact on the neighborhood justice. We have heard comments from many neighbors and abutters none of whom are in favor of this project. Please listen to them and continue this hearing. In addition to giving the neighbors more time to study details of this project, it would, at your direction, give this developer time to reduce the size of this project. We would love to see the historic house restored and a modest addition added. This developer is per perfectly capable of doing so, but needs your direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Coulterjohn. Um, seeing uh, no further hands raised, um, I'll give it another moment. Uh, I will go ahead and, oh, I'm sorry, I do see um, Stephanie Nikodich. Ms. Nikodich, I'll uh, recognize you. You, um, if you would mind unmuting your mic, if you haven't already, and you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Stephanie Nikodich, 93 High Street. So I, I mostly want to support uh, other speakers. Uh, Caitlin confirmed that there are measurements that were just presented or made available today. Um, and I think that the hearing should be continued to allow you and abutters to review all plan measurements. Um, and then I wanted to comment on what Mr. Coulterjohn was talking about, <clears throat> which is the corner lot uh, problem. So the applicant does, you know, the, the applicant says the historical commission lifted demolition delay, but it did that with two members voting no. Uh, the applicant also um, has brought forward to you the Secretary of the In Interior Standards that the Historical Commission looks at. And while they're saying <clears throat> compliance with those standards are not explicitly part of your criteria, 
They ask you to consider them in analyzing if this project is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. But one of these standards is not mentioned by the applicant, and that is a new addition should not be highly visible from the public right of way. A rear or other secondary, secondary elevation is usually the best location for a new addition. Because this is a corner lot, the addition will be highly visible from two public ways. In this situation, the size of the addition is even more critical for this neighborhood. The addition is too large, and as many abutters have said, detrimental to the neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Nikitich. And uh, I see the I see another hand. Uh, it's simply listed as Francis. Um, and uh, if uh, you can hear us, Francis, feel free to unmute your mic, and um, you have the floor. Hi, <clears throat> my name is um, Francis Moore, and I've lived on the street longer than anybody. So. Um, my, I've been there for 49 years, and my kids referred to this house as the Queen of Olive Street. Everybody has adored this house, it's my family, as we grew up with it. My feeling is that this addition steals, by, by virtue of the vertical space that is being proposed, it steals from our neighborhood our sense of air, of light, of trees, of bushes. It just, it just grabs it and it just feels really unfair. And it seems really unfair as well to Carol, who's how, who is affected by the, the aesthetics more than anybody of this addition being put in there and that it economically affects her house more than anybody else's. I just feel it's unconscionable that this should be just another another house being put in there. And it's just a fill in. This is not an addition. It's just a fill in for another whole house going into the neighborhood. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, ma'am. Um, any other, um, anyone else uh, who wishes to speak? Now would be the time, uh, just raise your hand. If not, I will close this portion of the public hearing and move on to questions. Going once, going twice, no further hands. I will go ahead and close this portion of the public hearing, and we will now uh, go into questions from the board. We'll begin with uh, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Champetti. Uh, I would just like to start out with um, asking the applicant to maybe address the parking issue that came up and maybe a little better explanation of, of the parking lots, the space, the dimensions that were brought up in, uh, in comments. Sure, thank you. Um... Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Moore. Um, so as you can see on this, pro on this uh, slide, there are four parking spaces that meet the requirements of the city's uh, dimensional requirements for parking on Russia Street and two curb cuts. And then there is one single space where it exists today off of Olive Street. Um, and so those are the parking spaces. That's five parking spaces for required to exist today. Um, on Olive Street. If I could just um, throw one other thing in there, because I, I think it's important um, as you go through this. Uh, the applicants submitted their revised plans on November 2nd. It, those revisions met all of the filing requirements of this board, including all of the dimensional requirements and including the last two slides that we have shown. That was part of my filing on November um, 2nd. Uh, the only addition that we put in today was um, there had been some questions for the dimensions of the floor plans in the addition. That's the only thing the, that hasn't changed. Somebody asked for the actual dimensions because apparently they couldn't scale them off of this plan, which has a scale and for whatever reason, they didn't do it. So there's no new information that was presented uh, this evening. I also just want to clarify uh, my colleague, Attorney Sheehan's comments related to the Bransford case, lest you all be uh, left with um, a misinterpretation of that case, perhaps, or a different interpretation of that case. Um, it should be noted that the real question in the Bransford case was, in fact, whether or not on a pre-existing non-conforming lot that was non-conforming for a lot area only, whether an addition to a house that only went up and didn't change the footprint would be subject to a special permit at all, not whether or not 
uh, the details of the discretion of the board were correct or incorrect. Um, what the court found was that in fact, uh, in a 3-3 decision, uh, the Bransford case, uh, the court said, yes, it would be subject to um, a special permit, which, which would be at the discretion of the board and they could apply uh, the substantially uh, more detrimental criteria as required. The Bransford case was later clarified by the Bjorkland decision, which affirmed that in fact, it was not by right, but by special permit that a person would modify pre-existing non-conforming structure, which was non-conforming by virtue of the non-conforming lot area. Um, so we're certainly not disputing the fact that the board has the discretion here under a special permit. Um, and the court itself said that in fact, the board had discretion under a special permit. So I, I just wanna be clear about uh, what the Brantford and then it's a case later, the Bjorkland case actually said, um, with that, um, I'll go back to the board and I apologize if I went on. No, nope, that's, uh, that's fine. And I'm going to just stop there and I have no further questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Moore. And uh, thank you, Attorney Mead, for uh, addressing Mr. Moore's question in detail. Um, Mr. Delisle. Uh, he recused. Ah, of course. Thank you. Um, Mr. Swanton. Uh, thank you. Um, first off, I want to say thank you guys for... Uh, working this through for delaying it enough times that you got through the historical commission first before you came to us. That's appreciated, although I realize it was not unanimous there, but still that's good practice. Um, I, uh, this is currently a two family house and it's proposed to still be a two family house. I assume that is correct, right? That is correct. Um, and, and I guess, you know, unlike some other projects we've looked at recently, you know, that have a lot of massing, when it's right on top of the street, it's a problem. Here, it's it's set back well, which is also a plus. But my concern is the total amount of massing, which is, I think we've heard from an awful lot of the abutters who have spoken. And I was trying to figure it out. I mean, you have you have the coverage, you, you said went from 24.7 to 24.5. So you basically have very similar footprint, but I guess you've replaced a lot of one story little buildings with a, with a large two story building. So even though the coverage is the same, I guess you went up 1491. Did I follow that 1491 square feet? That's, is that the increase in massing on this overall site? Uh, Mr. Swanton through the chair. Um, so it we took off the addition, right? So there were two right. additions. So we took off both of those additions, which ran the almost the entire length of the rear of the house. Right. And um, and then we removed the. There's a shed, and then of course the larger. You saw the photo of the larger uh, workshop on the property. Um, so the total amount of additional square feet that we're adding um, is 1,491. That's the net um, square footage. Okay, and, and the fact that the overall footprint didn't change that much, your coverage is similar, is because you got more square footage by basically going two stories where, like even the, the current edition, it says on this plan here, it's just one story, right? Did, yeah, no, this current, yes. Yes, so the current addition is one story. That's correct. Right, and, and the garage, I mean, the uh, the workshop is one story. And the that's shed correct. is one story, and the greenhouse is one story, and and there's another one, a wood patio. So so those are all little buildings? Well, the wood patio is not, it, it's kind of a wood patio. I don't know what to say, but um, it's not a building. So okay. it's a patio. Right. right. Okay, I get it. Right. All right, so, so the concern that I heard from a lot of folks is around when you take all that square footage and you, you make you may keep the footprint the same but when you add a second story and you pull it all together in the middle it would um it adds a lot of apparent massing to a neighborhood that doesn't have building i mean it has a building across the street but it's got six units i mean it doesn't i, I, I i'm um you had some tables you put up but 
but could you please try to address the question everybody raised of isn't this building too large? I mean, it's a, it's a pretty building for certain neighborhoods, but in this neighborhood, could you please show how this 5,000 square feet is, um, doesn't stand out? I, I, you had another yeah. chart, I think, that tried to do that. Absolutely. In fact, I, I would think it stands out for just the opposite. This, this property, as um, Ernie pointed out, is going to have more open space on it than most other properties in the neighborhood. Um, and if you could go, uh, Caitlin, to the my maps, I think would be the best. Um, I think that's like the third to the last slide, perhaps. And you can see that from this, uh, you can see the amount of open space on this lot. So if you could just blow it up a little bit to be clear. Um, so, thank you. So the, so you can see the house obviously in the yellow outline, right? That's the property. Right. So right across the street is the six unit building. And so it's building on lot coverage, not by dwelling unit. Even the house right next door um, represented by uh, Mr. Sheehan, attorney Sheehan is actually, that's a two family house. So if you take the whole lot, right? So the, um, it's not a 1200 square foot house, it's a 2400 square foot building, right? And they're all a building similar to the six unit across the street. So if you look at all of that in the neighborhood, you can see that this actually ends up falling in the middle of that. And I'll turn on to the to the um, tables in a minute. But obviously on the opposite side of Olive Street, you can see those lots are much more densely built upon. Um, and the, the right. lot, right, Go, excuse me. Could I just interrupt for one sec? I, my question wasn't about um, coverage. My question was about the size of this building. And this is a good page to have up. Um, if you take the buildings in yellow there and you add a big building off to the left of it then it does look like the only building uh, on the street that's anywhere i mean there's one that's bigger across the street the six unit building but is there any other building that's that's i mean i think the attorney said i think he said it'd be something like twice as big as the next biggest building what's the next biggest building on this picture here just to, well, you, I, well i want i'd like to I'd like to take the actual numbers because first okay. of all, part of the building here is coming off and then a portion is at being added, right? So right. It, so if you could go to the next slide, please, um, Caitlin. So if you look at, um, if you look at this slide and you look at finished area, um, certainly the finished area. So 18 and 20 Olive Street is a two family. So the finished area is um, uh, 1531, almost 33, 32,000 square feet. Is that right? Um, I mean, 32, 3,200 square feet. Um, and then you've got the, obviously the six unit, which is 12,000 square feet. Um, and uh, so those are the other single family homes. So yes, it's larger than the other single family homes for finished area on that section of Olive Street. So if you can go to the next slide, Caitlin. Is finished area, uh, what is finished area mean? Is that like the same as um, assessors used for living space? Um, I would say it's about that. We took it off the card um, so they would be consistent. So uh, it was- assessor's cards. Okay. Yeah, the assessor's cards. This. All yep. right, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that. So in this in, in this one, you see, so here's the proper number. So 18 to 20 is 3,200 square feet. And then they go 1,000, 2,300, 3,100. Ours is 55,100, right? So again, it's true that it is, there's one that's 7,000, 23 to 35, 25 to 35, that's 7,000. Uh, 45 Olive Street is 5,000. So it's certainly not the largest building with finished area. And there are others that are over 3,000. Uh, and then there's a 7,000, a 5,000. And then if you do that as a percentage of, of 10,000 square feet, which is the size of the lot area, it falls right in the middle of it. So it's a larger lot. And if you apply the dimensional requirements in 
the uh, ordinance, then it, it's certainly well within those requirements. You know, I, I would add that this lot is a completely conforming lot for a single family home. And all the people that are listening know what I'm about to say is the applicant could build without any relief a very large, much taller single family home by putting an addition also on this property and has chosen to do this instead, which results in a more compact uh, continuing use as a two family home. Um, and so they're moving forward with that instead of the by right, much larger attached garage room over mean, um, mean height 35 foot addition. Okay, I mean, I, I guess I understand it. It's, uh, it's a pretty good sized lot. So it's relative to its lot, the building may not be large, but in the neighborhood, there aren't very many other structures as big as this is proposed. I, I kind of get the dichotomy there. Um, all right, I, I thank you very much for that. Um, and I guess uh, the, uh, the other thing I just want to echo was that uh, I tried to look at these uh, some of these massing calculations uh, this weekend when I had some time, and I, I think this additional information you provided this afternoon would have helped me. And I would, it's unfortunate that some of this stuff comes in so late when it's when it's important for us to understand because the problem is if we if we come up with something like let's say we look at this afternoon we have a question and we want to ask. The staff at the at the city hall it's really not fair to them they don't have time to turn around a question for us so we really can't do that very well so i would really appreciate it if we could try to get all the information in sooner particularly on something like that pertains to the massing which is like the biggest complaint i've heard from the neighborhood anyway just a comment for the future i so, I, I i can appreciate that mr swanton um you know the applicant has submitted a significant amount of information um, and you know, shows the dimensional requirements, the height, all the all the dimensions on the plans. Um, you know, floor plans are not a requirement of a submission, and I understand why they can be helpful. But the information is also there, so I, I hear what you're saying. But um, you know, we could go on and on and on with the detail to be added. It, it, it the question is, when do you stop? No, I, I hear that. It's just in, in this case where it's such a concern in the neighborhood, I was trying to understand it myself and, and the additional data was helpful. Anyway, I have no other questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Swanton. Um, we'll uh, hear from uh, Mr. Channon. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess I, had, I just wanted to start a discussion on what's behind, um, as you're hearing, and I think most of us, when we looked at the presentation, uh, the thing that struck us was uh, the size of this new building in the backyard. Um, what's driving the size of that building? I mean, we see a lot of uh, applications come before us where someone knocks down uh, an old, you know, kind of dilapidated addition and puts a, you know, a nice little, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 square foot addition on the back and it's done tastefully and, uh, you know, it, it's an easy one to jump jump on board with. This this is a pretty large building with a hyphen in the middle. Um, what what's causing it to go that way? Is is there something in the background? I mean, is is that really meant to be one unit and the front house is another unit? It, it just seems like an odd uh, an odd way to go about getting more space in a two family house. Uh, Mr. Shagnish, for sure, um, I'm going to um, ask uh, Caitlin to go to slide um, either 17 or 18 for a second, and I think that I'm going to turn it over to Ernie. So the um, the second unit becomes the rear um, with a part of the hyphen. There's a significant part of the hyphen that's part of the second unit, and, and then part of the hyphen belongs to the first um, unit. But um, as Ernie said earlier, um, it goes to preserving the interior of the existing historic structure. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ernie to talk about um, to talk about that. Yeah, the um, the existing structure, if uh, looking at the image that we see right now, 
has a central corridor that starts on Olive Street and runs through the building towards the um, present backyard or towards the addition, let's say. And the, the space on the interior is divided into basically four quadrants. There are four rooms on each floor, um, one in each of the corners of the building with a central corridor running down the center. Um, the central corridor contains the uh, existing main stair of the building, which is in and of itself um, a beautiful historic element that we'd like to retain. But the building uh, does not have an inherent uh, organization that is conducive to a proper uh, 21st century to family structure. The way that uh, the current structure is subdivided is sort of um, there. Uh, the organization of it is uh, hodgepodge. I'm not sure how else to say it. There's um, uh, questionable areas of uh, code conformance. There are certainly not the number of rooms or spaces that would be conducive to a separate unit. And, uh, and actually, when you walk through the building, there was a place where uh, one of the timber columns had been removed to make space for kitchen. Uh, I, I don't know when that was done, but you can actually walk on the second floor and feel the bounce in the floor because whoever did that change did not um, make any structural modifications to the building to account for the timber frame being altered. Um, we did extensive amount of study to try and see how we could subdivide the four square floor plan into two units with um, kitchens and family room and a couple of bedrooms and bathrooms for each unit. And it became clear to us that we were gonna to have to substantially gut the interior of that um, building to be able to get two viable units in it. And I understand people sometimes make sacrifices for older buildings, but there does have to be, in order for that building to um, be successful in that neighborhood, it does have to take into account issues of building code, building access, that sort of thing. And also they have to be livable spaces. And there were sacrifices made uh, in past renovations or past, past fit outs that made some of the spaces unlivable in today's world. And uh, quite honestly, the idea of removing more structure to try and fit in the spaces we needed meant that we were going to have to do a substantial amount of uh, reinforcing, removal, reconfiguring, gutting of the interior, and we would have lost quite a bit of the historic elements and character of the building. Um, maybe from the street, people might not see much of a difference. On the interior, it would look nothing like what this historic house has been. And a lot of the features that really make this house historic inside and out would be lost. And- um, Does the plan, excuse me, just, just so we, for, for brevity, <laughs> is, it, is the existing building a two family today? Yes. So all this discussion you just had about, you know, trying to keep it kind of the way it is, there's two kitchens in it, right? There's Got to be multiple bathrooms. That's all going to be altered when, because you're going to change this front building to a single family and the rear building to another single family. Is that the intent? No. Well, so if I if I could, so the part of the kitchens are in that those additions that we're taking off, um, and but that's what um, Ernie was talking about, Mr. Chagnon, is that it had been it has been chopped up if you will but not the the guts haven't been lost but it's been kind of chopped up so it's not really usable without um, significant further work as a two family and further furthermore like you you mentioned bathrooms there are bathrooms that are tucked underneath stairs that have uh, no headroom uh, where somebody would have to bend down to be able to use bathroom uh, spaces that people nod and wink at in uh, you know 1950 but I can't build in 2021 so um, you know there are lots of that sort of things there's a 
um, an accessory stair that's used for one of the units, the, the space is divided left right. Uh, one of the stairs that goes from uh, Russia Street entrance up to the second floor, that is a completely non-conforming stair in any way. And in fact, it doesn't even have a landing on the second floor level. You go from a stair, you, you, you get to the top riser and you have to actually climb a step up to get into a room with no landing. If I substantially alter this building, I can't keep that stair. I have to build a stair that meets basic building code. So there is a lot of non-conforming elements in this building that as a two family um, would not work if we renovated this building that don't even meet basic code requirements. So it's not as simple as just saying, let's just um, put a coat of paint on the interior and keep it a two family. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't meet basic life safety issues on the interior. It doesn't meet basic circulation requirements. And to do so would involve us cutting the, the heart of this building out, which is not something we want to do. We actually care about this building and want to preserve as much of it as we can. I wasn't suggesting a, a fresh coat of paint, uh, although I'm, I'm hoping you will do that. Um, it was more what's driving this very large building in the back um, with the hyphen. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's something that uh, when we first, when all of us look at this presentation, it's the first thing that grabs you is this fairly large two-story building attached to another, it's, it's subordinate, I guess that, but another large building. Um, and unfortunately, all the neighbors are gravitating to the same issue. So I was just trying to understand why it's like that. Uh, you didn't convince me there's not another way, but um, but I appreciate your answer. I, I have no other questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, moving to uh, Mr. Beck. Yeah. Um, uh, is it Attorney Shan still there? Uh, let's, um, let's see. He's under uh, Michael T Attorney Tucker's uh, moniker. Um, so yes, here so. I just wanted to ask him if, his materials that he gave to, uh, I guess, to Andrew this today, uh, if he gave a copy to uh, Attorney Mead, Ross, I'll ask Attorney Mead, did you get a copy of that material, uh, Attorney Mead? I did. Mr. Sheehan and I have uh, worked opposite one another for uh, some period okay. of time, and he's, he uh, is always courteous to provide that material. I, 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 I would have assumed that was the case. Uh, uh, I haven't seen that, and Mr. Chair, I, I, for me personally, it would be helpful if if uh, I could actually spend a little time bathing in Mr. Sheehan's documents. Uh, and I know uh, he filed them with today with uh, Mr. Port, and Mr. Port's on vacation, so I can't really. Uh, I, I don't believe you know, Mr. Sheehan is at fault here in, in getting materials to us in a timely fashion. So. Um, I'm struggling to kind of evaluate this in the absence of that, although I, I, I heard Attorney Sheehan. So it's just an observation, perhaps uh, I, I'll, I would suggest that, that perhaps the board might want to have that in front of it, Mr. Chairman, before we can conclude our deliberations. And that might suggest a, a continuance, but uh, I'm not making a formal request, but I'm just throwing it out there as, as a thought. And I guess to Attorney Mead, do you have any uh, comments or observations with respect to Attorney Sheehan's presentation? Um, other than, well, so I, I would like to say this, um, you know, it's not a surprise that we are here this evening. In fact, we asked for continuance um, several weeks ago to this evening. So just like we have an obligation to get materials in in advance, uh, Mr. Sheehan's office wasn't recently engaged, but has been engaged by the neighbor since the historic commission. So um, like people don't like getting our materials the day of a meeting, um, I would su suggest that the um, board should also expect that uh, other people submit their materials. So Attorney Sheehan um, has about a, a two paragraph letter 
Um, and then he does include a um, property information sheet um, that includes similar information in a different style than what um, we've provided to the board. So, um, I, you know, I certainly wouldn't deny the board's uh, ability to review that, but if the board and or others are going to uh, criticize us for providing information that the board already has, I would request that the board be as respectful and require the applicants to provide um, provide the information um, in advance as well. So I, I wasn't criticizing you in any way. And no, I no, no, I understand. I understand. Um, so I, I guess um, I, I think that the board should hear uh, or read Mr. Uh, Attorney Sheehan's information um, in light of the information we provided as well. I, I don't have an objection to that um, at all. If, if I might, um, Attorney Mead, I'm, I'm going to just uh, I'm going to just interject for a moment uh, with uh, with due respect uh, to Mr. Benick and uh, and you on this. It sounds uh, so. That it, it appears, and I've been just taking notes. It looks like they're notwithstanding the volume of what the materials might be that uh, Attorney Sheehan has submitted some materials that uh, no one has seen um, other than Attorney Mead. Um, and uh, they sit in uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Port, our planning director's inbox until his return, but I'm sure it can be retrieved or resubmitted uh, if we ask. And um, it sounds as though at least one of our members, uh, Mr. Benick is inclined to want to, I believe, as he said, bathe himself in those documents. Um, so uh, we certainly would want him to have the benefit of the material. Uh, I suspect as would we all, but let me pull the board very quickly so that we can, in the interest of efficiency and economy of time, uh, given the rest of our docket this evening, if it is something that we're inclined to want to um, address now, we should do it now and see if, the, if we're gonna proceed further or whether we're going to uh, do something other than that. Um, I'm just gonna pull each member of the board to see, is there, um, uh, are you in a position, uh, do you feel inclined to want to proceed uh, to a decision this evening uh, without the materials that uh, you may not have seen. And uh, uh, let me just ask, uh, starting with Mr. Moore, um, do you want to proceed with knowing that there might be, it, it, as Attorney Mead described, maybe two paragraphs or other materials that we haven't seen from uh, from Attorney Sheehan or, um, or others? No, I, I would not. I think um, my colleagues have said it better than I have, so I don't want to steal their thunder. But I mean, clearly the, the issue here is, is going to be uh, the massing and any kind of uh, information that we can gather uh, should be gathered and, and analyzed fully. So, okay. So you would. So if I'm understanding you correctly, Mr. Moore, you're 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 saying that you would like to see this material and First. any other material in advance, digest it, uh, perhaps bathe in it, bathe in it, perhaps, um, yeah. and uh, and uh, and and then be able to make a more informed choice or decision. Okay. Correct. Not to put words in your mouth, um, but Mr. Swanton. <laughs> Um, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I too would really uh, I, I, I agree that uh, it'd be nice to have some time to uh, see the materials we haven't seen and to study them and think about them given all that we've learned tonight. And I would hope people, please don't give us something at three o'clock on the meeting of the next meeting, uh, at the day of the next meeting, because we don't necessarily all have time to do it at that moment. So try to get it to us ahead of time. Um, okay. And uh, uh, But I would concur, it would be good to continue this to give us a chance to do that. Thank you, Mr. Swan. Mr. Mr. Channon. Uh, yeah, that, that would be fine. I'm, I'm, I'm easy either way, but uh, yeah, we could put, okay. put off a decision till later, yes. All right. Um, well, so I, you know, I'll just say that. Look, I, I think that it's it's imperative and it's it's only balanced and fair in, in the spirit of this process. Uh, fair to not just um, you know an applicant or the many members of the public. I of which in this case I count twenty six attendees. It's hard to say how many are here for this application. But let's say there was just one. Um, one would be enough, right? Uh, as I, I suspect we would all agree. We if if we're to do this business fairly. Uh, and in a balanced way and aspire to get through something to completion. We, we absolutely need to have everything. Uh, we need to have it timely. I understand that some things, um, you know, uh, are de minimis changes, uh, if changes at all, they're just additional information. But at least I think it's an overarching statement and this is no, not directed at any of, our, uh, of the attorneys before us this evening at all. Um, but th this is just something for 
us to discuss with our, our colleagues in the planning office to see if we can implement a better way. Um, but for now, and with respect to this, I, I think it sounds, Attorney Mead, it sounds as though uh, the members are not prepared to move forward in, unless they sort of see the benefit of everything uh, and know that they're coming at this with everything in hand. I, I have to apologize to the members of the public that are here in attendance that in the spirit of getting the best decision, we must um, delay any decision uh, until we have all of the information, though I know that's inconvenient. How do you, how do you feel about that? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't, as I said to uh, Mr. Bennick's comments, we don't, we don't have a problem with that at all. It, it, the board didn't really actually need to be pulled because that was my comment to, to Mr. Bennick. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I would though, however, um, Mr. Chair, um, so the answer is we'd like a continuance, but I also would like to hear your comments relative to the proposal because um, we've heard from uh, four members. And so um, I, I would like to hear your comments. And then I would also like to know whether or not uh, the board would like to schedule a site visit because I think that uh, in this instance, uh, while a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, being on site is also helpful to understand uh, the neighborhood. Um, I will, okay, and that's fair. I, I want to make, I didn't want to short circuit you hearing uh, my, uh, my comments. Um, I didn't have, although we only got to questions, so I didn't no have questions. any questions. Yep. Um, okay. I have no further questions. I, I don't yet feel as though I, I'm prepared to deliberate, but I'll tell you that, you know, the questions that were raised by my colleagues, um, I share, I, I know this property well. In fact, I walked this ward when I first moved uh, to Newburyport way back in the uh, in the 90s. I, I know it well, I, I remember, I know this property, I, I know, I'm sure we all do. Um, I don't know it as intimately as the neighbors that live in, you know, in, in, and, in and around this area uh, for sure, but I, um, I'm i happy to take a closer walk through look, but um, I, I don't really have any, sense of it yet. Um, I don't have any questions that weren't already asked about the massing, the, you know, whether it can be done a different way. Um, so I, I, I know that's imperfect. I, I, I wish I could give you something more. No, that, that's fair. That, that's fair, for sure. Um, um, okay. uh, was there anything else? Uh, because I, I'll, I can certainly move, uh, move this along to, uh, to a continuance so that we can get everything in hand, uh, aspire to have everything digested. Uh, so that we can revisit this, you know, as promptly as possible with the benefit of all the news fit to print. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we would like a continuance. And I guess that I would like the board to, to think about whether or not they, they want to do a site visit or all go out and, and visit the site themselves. So, um, you know, we'd like to do a site visit. I don't know if the board's interested or not, um, but we'd also then take a continuance. Would, would we be able to have, uh, is there, I would love to just, I don't know when I'd be able to go and I suspect my, my colleagues might be in a similar situation, but having the, you know, having, um, uh, uh, you know, permission to, uh, to take a peek, even a closer peek, not trespass, of course, um, but just take a closer peek is that, um, you know, I suspect that's not a problem, right? Um, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's absolutely, that's absolutely fine. And we'll have the corners um, I think, I don't know if they're still on the corners or still in there or not, but we'll make sure the corners of the building um, are, are flagged. So the proposed building will have the stakes um, over the next, uh, you know, seven to 10 days put up. I, I, I for one, you know, and I, I, I plan to try to come by to take a look at that. So I, uh, I just don't know when I'd be able to, but okay. um, is there a date in mind, uh, a meeting that you want to try to shoot for, for a continuous? Uh, December 14th, please. Oh, I'm sorry, you said that. Uh, okay, so um, members of the CBA, we, uh, we have a request of the applicant to continue uh, to December 14th. Do we have a motion? So moved. Uh, was Mr. Moore seconded by Mr. Benick, was that right? Second yes. Okay, you can have it, but. Motion is uh, made by Mr. Moore, seconded by Mr. Benick on a motion to continue the uh, application for further information um, and, po and any possible site visit to December 14th, uh, calling the roll, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Swanton? Yes. Mr. Channing? Yes. Mr. Benick? Yes. And Rob Champetti, I vote yes. That's five in the affirmative. The ayes have it. Motion carries. The matter is continued to December 14th. And, uh, and uh, members of, uh, 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 members of uh, the public, uh, neighbors uh, that came to speak in this application, I certainly, uh, we regret that we have to uh, continue this. We certainly um, appreciate your input. We encourage you to uh, make yourselves available if it's in the cards to do so uh, for when we return. And we thank you for your patience, uh, Attorney Mead and, uh, and Mr. DeMeo as well. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Um, 
Moving to the uh, next application uh, before the ZBA this is the public hearing of the applicant Raymond Johnson on the application of 20 Lafayette Street. This is an application for a special permit for non-conformities. The applicant seeks all necessary permits uh, and approvals to add a first level master bedroom and bath. Uh, may we hear from the applicant? I believe uh, we will be hearing from Mr. Ray Johnston. Mr. Johnston, you have the floor. Yes, hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Raymond Johnston. Uh, my wife and I, my wife Lauren and I are seeking a special permit for nonconformities to uh, build an, a 17 by 28 single story bedroom bathroom addition to our home here. <laughs> on 20 Lafayette Street. Uh, that would be about 470 squ 70, 476 square feet. Uh, we've been here in our home for over 21 years. We've raised our, raised our daughters here and uh, we plan to stay here for many years to come. Um, with that in mind, um, as we grow older, we, we are thinking about first floor living. And that's the reason we would like to add a first floor master bedroom and bath for ourselves. Um, the design is uh, tasteful. Uh, it's keeping in uh, keeping with the character of the neighborhood. Uh, we have many direct abutters who are in support of our project, and um, those and some of those have folks have provided letters uh, of support. Um, I do have my architect here to speak to the more technical aspects of the project. Um, her name is Jean Allen of J, uh, JMA uh, Architects. Architects. Yep. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Uh, we, we can, Ms. Allen, and uh, uh, feel you have the floor. F feel free to, uh, to uh, present uh, your portion of the application. All right. Um, could we go to slide number seven, showing the existing front elevation? It's um, architecturally, it's described as a old colonial style residence, single family, three bedrooms on the second floor with one bedroom, one bathroom. Uh, next slide, please. Number eight, that is the side elevation, um, left side elevation where the addition is planned. Um, next slide, please. And that's the existing rear elevation. Um, there's a pool in the backyard and there's a patio um, connected to the back of the house and the family room. Um, for entertaining around the pool. And uh, next slide. And this is the proposed um, bedroom, master bedroom addition. It, it, it includes a large closet, laundry area, and a, and a master bathroom. Um, the bedroom, the master ba bedroom upstairs is relatively small, small closets. And so Ray and Lauren are interested in the whole concept of aging in place, putting their bedroom on the ground floor um, so that um, they don't have to negotiate stairs later in life. Um, next slide, please. And this is the proposed side elevation. It, the front wall of the proposed addition steps back away from the front of the house um, by almost four feet. And um, it aligns with the back wall of the um, dining room of the existing house. We minimize the slope on the roof, um, the roof pitch, in order to clear some of the existing windows and then um, on the second floor, and then also to make the whole um, architectural statement a little bit more subdued. And, um, you know, rather than proposing a, a, a dramatic roof line, we wanted to keep it a little bit lower, a little more subdued. And, um, and uh, just make it um, attached to the house. Um, and then you go from the existing house into um, this, this master bedroom area. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the rear elevation and um, there would be large um, 
patio doors that would face the backyard. And um, the existing rear elevation would remain the same structurally, nothing would change, just um, this one story addition. And the floor plan, um, if you go to slide 14, shows the layout. And um, so the bathroom and the walk-in closet would then be um, on the front of the house with smaller windows. And um, there would be three regular size windows on the side wall. And then, as I mentioned before, the two larger patio doors um, that would face the um, backyard. Um, any questions? Uh, we, we may have questions. We'll get to that phase, uh, but okay. I, I certainly uh, appreciate your presentation. And uh, was there anything else uh, you wanted to add before we will close the presentation portion and we'll go to questions from the board members? Well, if, if the... I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Jean. No, I just wanted to make sure that we um, talked about the non-conformities. I, I believe we meet all of the setbacks except for the front non-existing. And of course, that's not going to change by adding this addition. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnston and uh, Ms. Allen. Thank you for the presentation. We'll uh, close this portion of the public hearing and I will uh, now open it up to, quite, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to go to public comment uh, first. Uh, this is when we will um, ask uh, Ms. Sullivan to put up the public comment uh, page. Uh, and anyone who wishes to speak in connection with this application, uh, just raise your hand. I'll recognize you uh, to uh, give your name and address and share your thoughts. Um, I see uh, John Sarkis uh, with a hand up. Mr. Sarkis, if you uh, if you can hear me, uh, just feel free to unmute your mic and you have the floor. Though that may have been a mistake. Uh, I also see a hand up from Francis. Francis, I know you spoke on the previous application uh, on Olive Street. Uh, I'm not sure if you wish to be heard here uh, or whether that was just a hand left up. And uh, I see your hands down now. Um, and uh, Mr. Sarkis, uh, I see your hand up. Do you wish to be heard on this application? If so, just unmute your mic and uh, you have the floor. That may, uh, that may be a mistake as well. Uh, so I see no other hands up. Uh, we can circle back if something changes, but uh, I will go ahead and close this portion of the public hearing for the moment. Uh, and if uh, we find out Mr. Sarkis does wish to be heard, I, I'm happy to reopen that and take any, any thoughts and uh, comments from Mr. Sarkis. So we'll close that portion of the public hearing and now go to questions from the board. Uh, and we'll begin with Mr. Moore. Thank you, uh, Mr. Champetti. I just have uh, a quick question on maybe discussing, uh, maybe, would uh, you please discuss the blending of the building materials with the uh, the old and the new, the proposed addition with the existing dwelling? How's that going to mesh and, and what's being planned? On the front elevation, the materials will be the same. Mm -hmm. They will match the existing front materials. And then um, the rest of the building then would be cedar shakes, which match the existing siding material. Okay. So collaborate existing collaborate siding on the front matching uh, collaborate siding. Yeah. And then um, cedar shakes on the rest, the other two walls. Fair enough. Thank you very much. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, let's see, uh, Mr. Um, DeLau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just one quick question. Um, so the 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 barn door um, styling on the front, those are not functional. That's just uh, for a, a decorative element to sort of break up the um, the that wall because you're right. using that wall for uh, to, to for closet and bathroom in the front of that um, exactly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
All right, thank you, Mr. Delisle. Uh, Mr. Swanton. Uh, no questions from me. Thank you, Mr. Swanton. Uh, Mr. Uh, Channon. Question, but uh, just a comment. I like that barn door. Very cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Channon and uh, Mr. Benick. I have no questions. All right, I uh, I have no questions either. I um, I too like that barn door. I like the design. I think it's thoughtful. Um, I'll close that portion of the public hearing, and we'll now go into deliberations. Uh, in that we are uh, deliberating the um, a special permit for nonconformities. Um, as this board knows, uh, our deliberations uh, must uh, we must find as a board that there are no addition. There's no addition through this application of a new nonconformity. Um, we as a board must also find that the application will not be substantially more detrimental uh, to the neighborhood or the pre-existing uh, non-conforming use or structure. And when we make this determination, the board can consider factors such as massing scale, shape, volume, location, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, volume of the proposed structure or addition as compared to the existing structure and as compared to the uh, neighborhood uh, and that there are no reasonable alternatives. So um, I, uh, with that in mind, I'll ask uh, the board members to begin deliberations around that criteria. We'll start with Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Champetti. Um, no, off the top, I can say I can support this um, this proposal. I, I, there's no new nonconformity here um, encompassed with this addition. Um, the addition is is tastefully thoughtfully done, down to scale. Uh, attention to detail on the height of the roof uh, was made. Um, I mean, obviously the barn doors are fantastic, but um, no, it's it's just thoughtfully done. There's no issue with with size, scale, or massing at all. So it, I can see no way that it would be uh, detrimental to the neighborhood. So I can support it. Thank you, um, Mr. Delisle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would agree with Mr. Moore um, that this ticks off the boxes that we need to tick off for uh, our ordinance. Um, I too can support this, and I would also note that there were some. Uh, I think three three letters of support in the file from uh, from neighbors, so I I can support this uh, application. Thank you, Mr. Delisle. Uh, Mr. Swanton. Uh, I think my colleagues have just said it pretty well. Uh, for me, this is an easy one. I can support this. All right, and uh, Mr. Channon. Yes, uh, ditto a previous comment. Uh, it's a nice, modest addition, uh, tastefully done. Uh, great presentation as well. And uh, who, who can't love a barn door on the front of a house? <laughs> I can support this. Very good. And uh, Mr. Bennick? Uh, well, first and foremost, I too like the barn door. <laughs> so we're in, so we're in uh, unanimous there. Uh, now this is a fine project. It, uh, it, it meets all the regulatory requirements and uh, it has my support. All right, I, uh, I share all those sentiments. I have nothing further to add in deliberations other than I feel that it's a, a, a well a, a well presented application. It's very reasonable and uh, I, I like it. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll close the um, deliberations portion of the public hearing. And uh, do we have a motion uh, from a member of the ZBA? Uh, I'll make a motion uh, to approve uh, application uh, ZNC 21-3 for 20 Lafayette Street uh, special permit. Very good. Second. Second. Motion. Thank you. Motions made by Mr. Moore and seconded by Mr. Swanson. Calling the roll, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Delisle. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Yes. Mr. Shannon. Yes. Rob Champetti, I vote yes. That's five in the affirmative. The ayes have it. The motion carries uh, and the application is approved. Uh, congratulations and um, thank you very much for uh, your presentation, Mr. Thank Johnston. You. And, uh, thank Reluctant. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Have a good evening. All right. Uh, moving to our last public hearing uh, this evening. This is the application of Alfred G. Clifford. The, app, the uh, applicant address is 156 State Street. This is a three-part application. Uh, application one is a dimensional variance. Uh, the applicant seeks all necessary permits and approvals to allow a 90, uh, 90 foot of frontage where 120 feet of frontage is required for the construction of a multifamily. Uh, at the second component is a special permit for nonconformities. The applicant seeks to demolish a pre-existing non-conforming structure and construct, construct a new four unit uh, and accessory structure with a non-conforming lot area. And finally, uh, the third part of this application this evening is a special permit. 
uh, special permit um, seeking the permit and approvals necessary to allow a multifamily use change to use number 103. Uh, and uh, with that, we have uh, presenting on behalf of the applicant, both uh, the applicant himself, Mr. Al Clifford, as well as uh, Mr. Christopher or Chris Clifford. Uh, and uh, so with that, uh, Mr. and Mr. Clifford, um, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening, um, board members. And uh, I'd like to uh, introduce a, a very positive and uh, exciting project for Lower State Street. Uh, I'd like to thank, first of all, the planning office, Andy, Caitlin, and Jennifer for their help in uh, putting this uh, project's application together. They were, uh, they were very, very helpful in that regard. Uh, the existing building is the Port Sheet Metal Building on State Street. Uh, it is a uh, one and a half story steel cinder block building uh, with a metal fabrication retail use and consists of uh, 16,700 square feet of land with 90 feet of frontage on State Street. The lot is pre existing, non conforming. And I, as the applicant, am proposing to remove the retail trade use and the existing non-conforming structure and construct a, construct a multifamily structure. The B1 zone in which this property uh, is situated allows for multifamily as one of the uses. And the fact that it is a pre-existing non-conforming lot allows that lot to be used for multifamily. The First part of our uh, uh, application for relief. Uh, let me go over, first of all, the existing conditions. Um, the lot area requires 20,000 square feet, where the lot has 16,764 square feet. However, that lot is grandfathered uh, as pre existing non conforming and can be used, as I said for multifamily. The side yard setback requires 10 feet in that district. And at the present time, it is 2.7 feet. And on the other side is 0.9 feet. It is slammed right to the lot line. And the rear yard setback, 20 feet is required in that zone. And in this case, the existing building in one corner is encroaching on the neighbor's yard, 3.3 feet, and in the other corner, 2.7 feet uh, in from the lot line. Now on the upload, some information was, was dropped somehow. I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but the required lot coverage of less than or equal to 40%, where the existing coverage is over that at 44.5%. The frontage and front setback are conforming in the current condition. The DCOD is not triggered as the existing structure is not of historical significance. Next slide. This shows, uh, this is a site plan showing the existing building the dark outline, basically the rear half of the property. Uh, you'll see how it is uh, right on uh, the lot lines at the side and the rear and constitutes just under 7,500 square feet uh, of lot coverage. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the existing site, uh, front elevation. They, it's a story and a half. Inside, there is a, a, a portion of it that is a second story, but being commercial building, it's kind of a convoluted uh, second floor area. Next slide, please. This is the, uh, the rear elevation. 
And as I said, this is right on uh, the abutters lot line. Next slide, please. Another shot of the, of the rear uh, part of the building, again, directly on the abutters lot line. Next slide. This is the right, existing right elevation. Um, this one's important because the, the, the pitch of the roof is such as you can see uh, being right on the lot line, the pitch of the roof, rainwater drainage goes directly off and onto the neighbor's property, the way the building currently sits. It can't be avoided. And that's a huge roof. It's sheet metal. Next slide, please. Now, the proposed project is to demolish the existing structure and construct a four unit multifamily dwelling with an accessory structure, which is a, a garage for the last unit. Um, very similar in configuration to 172 State Street, just, just beyond this going down. Um, if anybody is uh, conversant with that area. Uh, we would want to change from retail trade use 403 to multifamily 103, <clears throat> which is allowed in that district. The proposal continues one nonconformity and eliminates four nonconformities while creating no new nonconformities. The, the nonconformity that's continued is the pre existing lot size. Uh, that does not change. The lot coverage is improved to 40%, which is in keeping with the dimensional controls. The rear setback is improved to 20 feet, which complies with the dimensional controls. The side A setback is improved to 29.6 feet, and side B is improved to 10.3 feet both exceeding dimensional controls. The parking will be improved with each unit having a two car garage in keeping with the dimensional controls. And the frontage remains at 90 feet where the 120 is required. Next slide, please. <coughs> this is uh, the the, the vision of the finished product. Now there's a one thing here that's particularly important from an aesthetics point of view. First of all, it's Greek revival in architecture, which is in keeping with that part of State Street. When I say it's in keeping with it, there are ver a variety of architectures as you go down. There's a couple of Federalists, there's a colonial, uh, and there's a Greek revival. This blends in very well architecturally. And the front unit, as you can see, is turned so that it faces State Street, such that as you drive up State Street or drive down State Street, what you will see is in effect a Greek revival house. And <clears throat> the, the other three units behind that are not particularly visible unless you look for them. Uh, I think this maintains the cityscape. And along with that, the setback from the street has been calculated by the city for us to be in keeping with the setbacks along that side of the street. So in total, I think the aesthetic result of what we propose is going to be very complementary uh, to, the, to the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the elevations uh, of the building. If you'll notice, the integral garages uh, between each of the units. Um, 
accommodating off-street parking, obviously, and covered parking. The, uh, the height of the building is only <clears throat> 20, excuse me, 26 feet. Uh, and this is in keeping with the area. The buildings on all around uh, this particular site are this height or higher. Uh, this building is lower than um, some of the townhouses uh, that are built beside this and behind it. And in the same manner, they're the same or lower as the new townhouses that were just built on the adjacent lot. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Actually, the, the second slide would, uh, excuse me, one more slide, please. That, this is easier to see. This is the, the site plan showing the four units, uh, also showing where the driveway is and where that accessory building is at the end of the driveway. It also shows a brick sidewalk, which we are putting in uh, and have um, also a tree in keeping with the uh, city's requirements for a particular type of tree. We are keeping all of the perimeter trees, as you can see around the edge. Somewhat fortunately, the trees that are there were on the very edge because the building was slammed right to the side uh, of the lot line. So we intend for privacy purposes for both our neighbors and ourselves to keep all of these mature trees. And in fact, we're going to add others to create even more privacy. Next slide, please. Now, the, <coughs> excuse me, criteria for the uh, special permit for use. The property is located in, a, in the business zone where multifamily is allowed by special permit. And it's, it's very important to, to understand that this, this whole area is, when I say whole area, this lower part of State Street on the right as you drive down is, is the majority of the buildings are multifamily. And it is a, a grouping of newer townhouse complexes, as well as older properties broken up into multifamilies. The, uh, the city includes the multifamily use in business, which recognizes that it it is appropriate to allow more dense developments in various appropriate properties. The proposed creation of a multifamily dwelling is certainly in keeping with the intent of the ordinance for multifamily use. Now all units will have more than sufficient parking with each unit containing an attached two car garage. There are sidewalks on State Street on both sides in this location. As a result, there'll be no detrimental impact with regard to traffic or pedestrian safety as a result of the proposed multifamily use on the site. In addition, the property, while located in a business district, is close to the R3 district, and the rear lot line abuts a residential district. So the residential context of this change in use is in keeping with the area and will complement what is currently there. In this section of the business district, there is a mixture of single family, two family, multifamily. The proposed use is, is consistent with this neighborhood in general, and it, will not, and it will not impair the integrity or character of the district or adjoining districts. In fact, it will enhance it because right now, there is a use there which is completely incongruous with all of the properties around it.
Uh, next slide, please. Back one slide. Back one slide, please. Slide 14. Slide 14. Slide 14, please. Oops. Oops. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, next one, please. I'm sorry. Now, <clears throat> with regard to the criteria for the variance relating to the lot frontage, the primary hardship is a non-conforming structure in current use. 85% of the parcels on lower state are residential and the requested variance can be supported without harm to the intent of the Newburyport zoning ordinance. The irregular shape of the lot due to its large size and the non-conforming structure renders it more conducive to supporting the proposed multifamily, a permitted use. Now, a hardship may be found to exist where Zoning Board of Appeals finds that owing to circumstances relating to soil conditions, shape, topography of such land or structures, and especially affecting such land or structures. It is important to recognize that a large majority of the parcels on lower state are also non-conforming for lot frontage. The proposed change will not be more detrimental to the neighborhood and the proposal is entirely consistent with the residential nature of the surrounding properties. Next slide, please. This is, <clears throat> if we look at this uh, GIS map, the property in question, 156 Straight Street is at the top and it shows the 90 uh, feet of frontage. Now, next door to it on the upside is a six unit condominium development. Its frontage is only 71 feet. As you come down to the next property below 156 State Street, there is a pork chop lot with three new townhouses in the back and it only has 32 feet of frontage. Going further down the street, two or three, is 172 State Street, which again has 108 feet of frontage. So the precedent for the uh, less than 120 feet for multifamily is exhibited in these other properties, um, some of which are, are quite recent. Uh, and we feel that uh, it will not be detrimental. And in fact, it will blend in to the area that surrounds the property. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, next slide, please. Now, in additional considerations, um, there is a list of abutters in support. I sat with 16 of the 20 on the city abutters and abutters to the abutters lists and received uh, overwhelming support for the project. As the list will show you, uh, I believe have that list. Yeah, it's slide number eight. 18, yes, there we are. Thank you. Um, but just to show you that we have reached out to everybody uh, and the, the only concern that we've run into at this point is uh, the property 
to our right, which is a condominium complex, a couple of those folks voiced concern about stormwater runoff because they are the ones that are next to the existing building where that roof dumps onto their land. Now, of course, we'll be going back to conformance with dimensional controls. So the new building will have the required setbacks from the lot line, both in the rear and the side. And in addition, we are working with uh, John Eric White, the city engineer, uh, to come up with the plan. He's, he's uh, putting, helping us put it together for stormwater runoff. It will be contained on the site. In other words, the gutters will run into uh, uh, dry wells and the, run, the, the driveway runoff will be contained with, uh, with, with great uh, catch basins, as it were, uh, that John Eric White has indicated can be conduited directly to the city in the street, or we can handle it on site. The soil types there are exceptionally good. They're sandy, they're very good perk rates, such that drainage in general is good on that particular in that particular area. So we have taken steps to ameliorate that situation. Uh, and then uh, the, oh, the other issue on the side, uh, again, to our right, uh, again, the same condominium complex, there's an existing fence and we have, again, in our landscape plan, we are keeping the fences that exist and adding a new one in back. Well, the, the, the fence that exists on their side uh, is, uh, how shall I say, suboptimal in condition uh, by their own admission and, uh, and ours. And uh, I've met with one of their representatives and, and we've agreed to work with them on, on uh, reconstructing that fence line. Uh, those were the, the, the issues that I had uh, were brought to my attention. On the other side of the property, uh, uh, to our left, the abutters are, are very much in favor of the entire project, both the townhouse in back and the single family house that is on uh, State Street. The, uh, I think, Mr. Chairman, I, that constitutes uh, my presentation. I would direct your uh, attention also to Mr. Jim McCarthy's letter, uh, which is slide 19, uh, which, in which he details uh, support. He is the former chairman of the planning board in Newburyport. And he also is a champion of the uh, Rails End Village Center, which is the nomenclature used for development of the rotary at the end of State Street. And uh, the, the, it's envisioned to become a center in and of itself. And he sees that this is, is an asset and a great adjunct uh, to the development of that center. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Clifford. Um, anything else um, before we uh, move along? Uh, not at this time. Very good. Thank you for a, a very thorough and detailed presentation as always. And um, I will uh, close this portion of the public hearing and we will go to the public comment section. I'll ask uh, uh, Caitlin to put up the uh, public comment slide as always, and uh, we will go to any, um, any hands uh, and any, anyone in the audience who wishes to be heard. And uh, I see, it uh, uh, looks like Jesslyn Sullivan. Um, I will start with you if, uh, if you wanna unmute your mic um, and just give your name and address again for the record and you have the floor. Um, good evening, this is Jesslyn Sullivan at 152 State Street, number four. But I'm also joined by Linda Dolmatch at 152 State Street, Unit 1. And I think Linda would like to start, if that would be okay. Uh, yes, 
Okay, All right. I'm Linda Dolmatch. I live at 152 State Street, Unit 1. And um, I have lived here for almost 20 years, so I'm delighted to speak to this. I want uh, to be very clear that I am not opposed to the request for uh, the variance in terms of demolishing the State Street building and uh, converting to multifamily use. Um, it's certainly not an attractive building, but they have been good neighbors all these years. I am, however, very opposed to the density that's being proposed on that property. Um, and I have some concerns. I have not met with Mr. Clifford and I uh, wish that uh, we had had a presentation to the group um, in order to understand better. I hear that he's putting a plan together for the stormwater drainage, but that is not done yet. Um, I have concerns about sewage backflow, you know, a number of years ago, maybe five years ago with three units, because the six units on the side at 152 are two separate buildings with a tremendous amount of uh, land in the back. We had sewage backflow and had to excavate, replace the pipes. And I can't imagine that the sewage um, pipes next door are any different. So it's the density that I am concerned about in the lack of open space. I'm very happy to hear because I had not a chance to look at the documents that were, I understand made even more available today, um, that, that there are plans to collaborate with the condo association around the fence because screening for the air conditioning units in the back um, of those buildings as a concern as it faces our bedrooms. I am the president of the condo association and I had no idea that this collaboration was taking place. So I am um, pleased with that, but certainly would like more of a chance to understand, you know, the keeping of the trees on that side. It's, it's interesting because I really thought many of those trees were on our property line. So I'd like the chance to um, continue to discuss this uh, before any variance for four units is granted. Um, I do oppose that. I think this property would be much better with three um, to preserve some more of the open space. Thank you for the chance to speak. And may I follow up with that? Again, this is Jesslyn Sullivan. Absolutely. Absolutely. Go, go ahead, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, my unit is actually in the back, um, and mine is one that not only faces this new complex from the front, but also from my deck. So I was um, I was heartened to hear Mr. Um, Mr. Clifford indicate that he wanted to optimize the trees. Um, I'm hoping that there could be maybe some more effort put into something, maybe some conifers or something to provide some some better privacy. So that would be a concern of mine, and and um, I'm hoping that we can have some good conversation about that. Um, to, to Linda's point about Rails End and um, the, uh, the density, I am equally concerned, not just from the standpoint of uh, the property next to us having four units, but it's just the neighborhood in general is getting very, very dense. And to the point that Mr. Clifford raised about 172 state, it is a good um, way to get a, a a benchmark for what this is ultimately going to, to look like. Um, certainly the design is appealing enough, um, but the density when you see 172 State Street, it is um, surprisingly dense. I was very surprised. I remember when that was first built and I've heard a lot of anecdotal comments about it um, over the past year or two since that went up. Um, I do uh, want to follow up just a little bit with that conversation about the um, the, the, the runoff. Uh, we did have uh, we did some regrading of our uh, driveway and parking lot a couple years ago, and we did contemplate putting in hardtop. And we had some engineers look at it, and they did voice some concerns and indicated that we had a lot of work to do relative to putting in dry wells and so forth. The concern that they brought up was not about the runoff from the, um, the roof of uh, poor cheap metal. So I was kind of surprised to hear that that was the cause of it. But um, 
in any event, um, I'm glad that it is being addressed. I look forward to seeing more information on that. And I would like to know at some point in time how we how that would actually be monitored to make sure that in the development that that in fact was all being taken care of. And with that, I thank you for your time. Very good. Was that uh, that that was uh, there was no further comments, Miss Miss Sullivan? I just want to make sure we. That's that's all from uh, Linda and myself. Yes. Very good. Thank thank you both. Um, any uh, further comments? Uh, just kindly raise your virtual hand. I see uh, Edmund Latimy uh, and uh, uh, Roy Bean. I'll recognize Edmund Latimy first. And uh, if you uh, could unmute your mic, bottom left, and just give your full name and address, and you have the floor. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Um, I'm Edmund Latimy um, with my wife, uh, Holly Latimy. We're owners of 152 State Street, Unit 5. It's one of the ones in the back. And as was said earlier, we're not against the, uh, the plan, um, but we have two, two comments or concerns. One you've heard is the stormwater drainage. Um, the plan development includes four houses, four two-car garages, along with patios and a large driveway, which results in what seems to be almost no grass or dirt for drainage. So we were pleased to receive today uh, a copy of a memo from city engineer, Mr. White, um, which focused on the recent report has been mentioned by Mr. Clifford, um, that would suggest that uh, roof downspout drains into basins. Um, and given the major driveway would require one to two large catch basins and perhaps piping into the city sewer. This is going to be critical, especially with that density. And we would hope that these remedies would be required rather than recommended. And if they're insufficient, that a fallback would be mandated. Another potential remedy would be to reduce the number of houses to two or three with resultant increased land for drainage. Our second concern has to do with privacy, which has also been raised by one of our neighbors. Um, and given the short distance between the rear of the new houses and the front of some of our houses, Rear windows of new houses will end up looking right into the upper floors of uh, one of at least three of our houses and overlook the property. I was pleased that Mr. Clifford just mentioned this, but as has been mentioned by one of our neighbors, um, we're really concerned about trees or some kind of uh, other shielding uh, because of that. The other Related one is noise, um, and the assumption is that there are air conditioning units all along the rear, and so that kind of shielding that would in, that would block that would also be preferable. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Latimy, and uh, uh, Mr. Roy B. You have the floor. Uh, yes, my name is Roy Bean, and I am uh, at 162. Uh, State Street, Unit 1, and I also have with me um, Kim Lively, who is uh, 162 State Street, uh, Unit 3. Um, I guess I'll start with my first comment that um, I hate to do this to contradict on my first opening comment, but um, I did meet with uh, Mr. Clifford when he came around um, and that document that he displayed for us tonight that um, talked about our um, strong support, especially coming from 162 State Street, um, who is the abutter to the Southwest and to the left of the property, if we're looking at the property. Um, our understanding is that we were signing that, or I was signing that document as a acknowledgement that he had spoken to us, not necessarily our approval. So I'll start with that. Um, not saying I'm outright against the, uh, the proposal, but that was certainly was not as I, I was not signing my name to anything to that extent. Um, my concerns are uh, regarding, as has mentioned, um, the stormwater runoff, snow melt. Um, we're on the side with uh, looking at this proposal of with the, um, the driveway, which is uh, extremely close to the our property line um, as it runs down not leaving a lot of place for snow melt, um, for plowing, as well as um, obviously an impervious, 
permeable surface uh, of asphalt on the plans could create water runoff. I heard about the catch basins, but it also mentioned that could be tied to the um, city, to the street runoff or to the streets system to take away the water versus um, actually tied to the street. Um, I guess I would be more inclined to uh, support it if it was actually tied to the street as opposed to just could be tied to the street. Um, the other piece of this is that due to obviously the density of the four units, um, these units and especially the fourth one is looking essentially right towards our property um, and we lose quite a bit of uh, privacy. The building that's there, albeit not very uh, attractive, uh, is extremely low and um, almost non-existent. All we see is roofs. When this is done, we will see uh, windows and lights and people's houses directly into our driveway. Um, because of the small space next to the driveway on this plan, I don't believe there's a lot of room for trees in that area. And most of the trees that are on the site plan that Mr. Clifford um, showed us are actually off of the property as was also, I believe, mentioned by the folks over on uh, 152 that most of the trees are off of that property. So it sounds like there's very few trees, obviously, given the existing structure that's there that goes right up to the property lines. There's no room for trees anywhere around this thing. So they must be on the abutters properties as opposed to uh, proposed in this plan. Uh, so and uh, I'll defer to Kim. Um, I do have some concerns about the height of the back building. It's, uh, it seems like there will be third story um, living on that part of the, uh, on that um, fourth structure. And that directly looks into my backyard. And some of the other, I think the third would look directly into my bedroom window. So I definitely have concerns about privacy. Um, and as mentioned before, I don't want to overstate, but the, the drain water and the storm water runoff is a, is a, is a definite concern, um, as is the density of the proposed buildings. Um, and that is, um, that's about it. That's, those are my major concerns. Um, and I'm not opposed to this at all as well. I think it'll be a nice addition to our street if done correctly. And, and I guess I'll, again, this is Roy Bean. I'll add one more comment just for maybe clarification on Mr. Clifford's side. Um, looking at the plans, it looks like the, um, the, the last building that, uh, that Kim was referring to um, has a height on the plans of 29 feet, eight inches, slightly different than uh, Mr. Clifford's comment of 26 feet as the um, height. Very good. Um, was there anything else, Mr. Bean? Uh, no, I think that's it, thank you. Very good, thank you, Mr. Bean and uh, Ms. Lively for your uh, your comments as well. And uh, with that, we will, um, looks like there's one uh, final hand raised, uh, though if you wish to raise your hand, uh, feel free, I'll continue to recognize them. But we have Corey and Tammy, uh, that's just the name listed. Corey and Tammy, if you uh, could unmute your mic, you uh, have the floor. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, kindly give your first and uh, last name and your address for our- Okay, uh, wanna make sure, can everybody hear me okay? We can hear you now, yes. Okay, my name is Corey Prince. I'm here with my wife, Tammy. We live in 152 State, unit number three. Uh, unit number three, just for some reference, is one that directly faces pretty much the middle of the lot, uh, which this proposal is being applied to. Um, you know, first and foremost, I do want to thank the board for the opportunity to meet. I know this is late in the agenda and late in the evening. So thank you for that. Um, I do want to echo, it, it seems to be a repeated topic uh, across pretty much everybody who's speaking, but a, a few core things, one of which is 
you know, there's discussions about the density and we absolutely share that concern. Uh, you know, we have children bedrooms at the front of our unit, which would basically be parallel uh, with potential height of this proposed uh, uh, multifamily. Uh, one thing that's important to also acknowledge here is, is that is if I interpreted the plans correctly, uh, while they are designed in kind of a, a Greek revival style, there is a persistent ridge line. Uh, this ridge line is approximately, I think, about nine feet uh, over the current structure uh, and basically run the course of all the proposed units. So it, while this doesn't have any kind of architectural variance to be able to provide uh, different angles and different views, this, you know, from, from an abutter side, this will look as one formidable building that is just long. Uh, a couple of additional things too, there's been a lot of comments about kind of the drainage. And one thing that I haven't seen in the proposal, and I know there's discussions about working through drainage um, with the town. But for those who have been to Port Sheet Metal, uh, it's actually, that building actually sits below grade. So I haven't seen anything that is really addressed. I, uh, I, I haven't measured these things, but if I were to estimate, it's probably at least a foot or two below grade off the street. So that's going to change the topography of the land while we talk about what the current runoff state is building up that land to accommodate street level is going to change the conditions of that lot. So when we look at that, we really need to have an understanding of what that plan is going to be, not only how they're going to build up that space to be able to support um, the structures, but also what kind of environmental and drainage conditions are going to be uh, imposed as a result of that. Uh, and then lastly, I would just talk about, you know, and, and again, this has been phrased multiple times, it's just privacy concerns. Uh, you know, we are ones that literally would be looking right into the back. I think there's maybe 25 feet of space that would be from one of our kids' windows to the back window of one of these spots. So it's very important that we have uh, privacy concerns taken into consideration. I think that's it. Very good. Um, and uh, you had mentioned uh, your, your wife, Tammy, was with you to uh, yes. Tammy yes. speak as well. Um, sure. I would just add that I, I echo uh, my husband's comments and everybody from um, from an abutter standpoint and just think, you know, potentially a plan that that I'm not opposed to this. Again, I agree. It looks a lot better than than the port sheet building. Um, having said that, I do want to make sure that when we talk about its construct within the the district and the area, that it doesn't become a, a a monstrous piece, but rather something that does sort of fit nicely. And I certainly think that can be done with three units rather than four. Very good. Uh, thank you very much for your comments and. Uh... Uh, were there any, was there anyone else uh, who wished to speak before I close that portion of the public hearing and go to questions from the board? Seeing no additional hands, going once, going twice, I'll go ahead and close that portion of the public hearing and we will uh, jump into our next segment, which is questions from the board. We'll begin uh, in questions with uh, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Chairman Champetti. Um, my first question is going to go to the heart of the drainage issues that seem to to be a big part of um, the concerns of the abutters here. And we noted from our from our notes that the project has uh, preliminarily been reviewed by, by the city engineer and you're working closely uh, with him. Um, you're gonna be required to apply for stormwater management permit. Um, we've been, it's been recommended that um, that we require, should this go forward, that we require you to submit to the city engineer a grading design for parking, walkways, and driveway for approval prior to issuing a building permit. Would this be something, uh, is this something that you're aware of, is something you're working towards? Um, I just wanted to hear your comment on that. Yes, uh, we are aware of that, and that is uh, uh, going to be part of the process before, of course, we get any building permit that would have to be accomplished. 
Okay. And, and with respect to the, the trees, um, which we're, we're all gonna um, be maintained and, and perhaps added for, for privacy, um, along the side of the driveway, there's been a concern that um, with, you know, obviously it's, it's gonna cause uh, runoff because it's, it's covered with, with asphalt. But just installing a driveway, um, it's also been recommended that um, we find a way to make sure that you are um, consulting with experts, arborists, that you know, installing um, and clearing the ground, grading it properly, installing a driveway this way wouldn't actually harm the trees. I know your intent is to keep them, but um, is that something that you've been made aware of and something that you would be opposed to? If we require yes, that, we've been made aware of that, and we are not opposed to doing that. Excellent. Um, and I just, I'll just do one more. I have one more question. It's on the back unit that has that looks at the third floor bump out. That's that's higher than everything else. I assume that's to make up for the lost space, because you don't have the space over the two car garage at the end of the building. That is correct. What is the, the square footage difference, I guess, um, with that bump out? Um, what, I guess, what, what square footage does that add to that, that last unit? And what would be lost if that, that top piece was gone? It adds about 400 square feet. So the differential would be about 400. OK. All right, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Uh, OK. Mr. Delat. Um, I'm going to suggest something. I've never done this before, but I'm going to suggest that uh, based on the presentation uh, and the detail with which uh, uh, the information was provided, the, the comments from the abutters, uh, that there's just a lot to unpack here. And considering the lateness of the hour, I don't think that we're going to really get through uh, the, this whole thing tonight. Uh, so I would just, I would suggest that we continue this to, to another night and uh, give the board time to sort of digest what we heard tonight, uh, ask questions of the people in the planning office because it just seems like there's an awful lot to unpack here and I don't I don't want to rush through and and not give these various issues the attention that they deserve so I think that's sort of what I would uh what I would think uh what I'm thinking at this point and if if the other board members disagree that you know that's fine we'll soldier on but I, I think that there's just an awful lot to address here at, at this late hour. Um, okay, all right, Mr. Delisle, let's take a moment um, as we go through the questions. Um, let, me, um, let me just spin through the rest of the board uh, and, uh, and just take a poll for a moment on thinking in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, availability of time, attention, bandwidth, and just getting the best, uh, you know, the best uh, absorption rate for all of us, but let's see what, what everyone else thinks with respect to your comments. Um, and we'll circle right back. Uh, Mr. Swanton, uh, your thoughts on, on whether to proceed or uh, and continue to, as Mr. Lyle says, unpack uh, the uh, details or whether we, uh, we allow ourselves some time to digest, absorb and, and revisit this fresh in some manner. Well, I have a lot of questions and it's almost 11 o'clock. And in order to do this correctly, I just, I concur, I concur completely with my colleague, Mr. Delisle. Okay, let's start with just that, uh, because I have questions as well, and I suspect I'm not alone in, in this, but um, there may well be answers to those questions, but there's a lot, there's a lot going on here for sure. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Channon, I'm sorry, Mr. Swanton. That was me. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you, Mr. Channon. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think um, I think we'd be best served if we could spend a little bit more time on this. I, I think we're all going to have questions, and I think um, I think since we're unpacking, you know, three different uh, uh, applications here, I, I think to to do this fairly, uh, some more time is warranted. I agree. All right, uh, and um, Mr. Uh, 
and thank you, Mr. Chan. And Mr. Bennett. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. Um, so uh, with that, let me press pause for a moment on the questions from the board segment and go to our applicant, Mr. Clifford. Um, uh, you've heard the uh, the comments of the board. I, I I have to say that in fairness, you know, notwithstanding the hour, um, there are three very technical matters before us. One of which is extraordinarily uh, technical and uh, and you know um, steeped deeply in the mire of the legal criteria of, uh, of hardship, and that's the variance application. In light of what we've heard from the public uh, and in light of what we have before us, um, what are your thoughts on a continuance uh, to allow the board time to digest, uh, formulate questions, be in a position to uh, maybe adapt questions, maybe give you time to have conversations if that's something you are inclined to do uh, with the, um, the, some of the abutters from whom you've heard. Uh, or not, but um, either way, what, what are your thoughts on a continuance uh, to, on this matter? Mr. Chairman, I, I, don't, uh, I don't object to the continuance. However, it would be very helpful to me if the board, the remainder of the board were to uh, ask, uh, uh, <clears throat> by asking questions, it gives us a, a better idea of what we need to uh, concentrate on. And uh, your, your first member uh, has asked some questions. It would be helpful if uh, perhaps some of the other members could at least uh, put forth a couple of questions. Um, well, I can certainly, I can certainly invite them to do that. Um, you know, obviously we understand that we can't, in a, we can't really proceed in a vacuum. So I, I just would caution your expectation, perhaps, and respectfully so, that you know the questions will lead to additional questions uh, for sure. So uh, I know that they won't be exhaustive. So with that in mind, I'm happy to spin back to uh, to uh, my colleagues. Uh, but I think that my sense of it is that to you know the best possible approach in fairness to uh, to your application, to you as an applicant, and to uh, all of the abutters concerns. And to uh, you know the members of the board is to try to you know let everyone have a moment to digest a lot of what's happening. But let's go back to the questions so that if that's in the cards, we part company here this evening with you know uh, with with you having a sense of what what were the highlights of things that were concerning and alarming or or you know or or well done etc. So um, I will. I think, um, that's, I think that's what we're looking for is a sense. Okay. I, I will um, I will leave it to each board member as to whether you know how how deep into the questions they want to commit to, uh, but certainly we'll invite them to uh, to offer what what they might have. Uh, Mr. Swanton, you had mentioned you had a few questions. Um, anything um, that would be valuable to share with uh, with uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. and Mr. Clifford um, on uh, you know if they are to if they are to take a step back and a pause on a continuance. Well, um, Mr. Chairman, you made an excellent point that sometimes you ask a question and then that leads to another question, another question, another question. So I'll just give you two categories that okay. I might, might wanted to have probed down. Um, and one question might have led to the next. Since I do not want to get into a debate here, I'd like to move on. Um, um, but my categories, uh, one is around the variance. You already mentioned yourself. Uh, that is a pretty high bar for us. And particularly when a lot of the abutters are, have, have issues. Um, and it's, uh, you know, what are the criteria for variance here? Where is the hardship? I'd like to probe that. Another area I'd like to probe is density. We've certainly heard that from an awful lot of the uh, neighborhood density here. Uh, and um, does it need to be four units? Uh, you know, it is not a, it's not a very big lot compared to them. I mean, the lot that a lot of these people spoke on, yeah, they have six units, but the lot's three and a half times as big. So, I mean, it's, this is a really small lot compared to theirs and some of the other ones. So I was gonna probe okay. there as well. Anyway, those are my, those are my general categories. I, I may come up with some more. And sometimes when I listen to my colleagues ask questions, I come up with others. But anyway, to give you some things to think about. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, thank you. Um, let's, um, let's, let's go to uh, Mr. Chan. Yeah, I, I guess uh, like Mr. Swanton, my questions would be around the variance. Mm -hmm. I think the other two uh, applications um, I understand pretty well and, 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 and probably are on board. Um, but with the variance, as stated, it's a little bit of a higher bar. Um, you know, try, trying to come up with, uh, you know, 
the bullets that uh, make sense uh, where there's a hardship. And, um, you know, it, one of the other criteria is if, if we don't agree with the variance, uh, it wouldn't have, uh, you know, use of the lot. Um, that's, that's another high, high bar, at least in my mind. So I, my questions would be around that, trying to solve the, the variance issues. Uh, because obviously that that's uh, that's one of the uh, the prime objectives for them to to be able to use this lot is to have uh, you know the variants go through. So I, I would spend most of my time asking questions about that and discussing it. Very good. And uh, I will circle back to uh, you, Mr. Delisle, uh, before we 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 move on. But uh, Mr. Benick, uh, I wanted to just get your thoughts very quickly. Yeah, I, I would. That would be interesting and following up on those very same issues. Also, some of the what I'll call the softer kind of good neighbor issues that uh, uh, the neighbors have raised as well. Uh, as you said, there are, you know, there's a lot to think about, and uh, I think we need to reflect on all of those issues. Thank you. And Mr. Delisle, anything, um, obviously, you, you had it. It was your, um, you had instigated the, uh, the us to reflect on this, so I, I didn't want to short circuit um, whether or not you had formulated any questions yet or whether it's still too premature. No, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I would say that, uh, you know, my questions uh, would have revolved around the same sort of issues that were raised by my colleagues, the variance, uh, the density, um, the, uh, the, the stormwater management issues. Um, I think that those are, those are the critical pieces here. I think one one comment um, from one of the abutters that that struck me was the um, sort of the length of the building and the length of the ridge line itself. And I think that goes probably to the density issue as well. But I think those are the the things that uh, Mr. Clifford um, that that I would ask questions about and and would be the the issues that um, you know would in my opinion, merit some reflection. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, Mr. Clifford, I, you know, uh, and, and just to round things out, my sense of it would be, I think what, um, what I'm hearing are the principal questions and categories are, you know, um, what about the hardship if I'm to just kind of summarize them? Um, why so dense and, uh, and what about neighbor concerns? So these are sort of the, the big, the big picture, you know, the, the, the big picture items, perhaps. Um, I, I know that these are far more granular and uh, in fairness to the questions, I'm sure there, there's gonna be more questions spawned by us unpacking or attempting to unpack those questions. But I, I share those sentiments and I, uh, I think that it's probably not an, un, you know, an unwise endeavor to try to drill down some of those um, issues and see if, um, if, if there's a way to provide some time for the board, but also perhaps um, see what if any of the concerns you heard from uh, others, you know, are easily addressed or solvable, if at all. Uh, but I want to give you the opportunity to ask us if it's in, you know, if it's something you're willing to or, or interested in doing to, um, if you want to continue the matter, we would certainly be inclined to, uh, to do that and, and allow time for all to try to get a better, you know, a better grapple on everything. Sure, Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, request a continuance. Uh, okay, and um, I think what are, my what are my options? I think we have well, we have space to. Um, let me let me see, um, Caitlin. What I, I would want us to have, I, I don't want to put um, um, uh, Mr. Clifford's application on a, on a night that we have, you know, so, more than a few substantive applications on because I think we'll. I don't want us to run into the same situation. Uh, what what does the calendar look like beyond? Um, I mean, I think that the meeting of December fourteenth, we had just moved one application. What does that hearing look like? And then um, December fourteenth is extremely full, but we off, we always put the continuances on first before new applications. So mm -hmm. this um, agenda item would go um, third. What? Uh, how many applications are on on the fourteenth? Uh, so the 14th, so we'll have three continuances and three new applications. Yeah, that, that makes for a 1 a.m. Yeah. 
No yeah. I, I'm afraid we can't do that. Um, and then the 12-28 meeting, it looks like we have three new applications. No, no continuances, three new? That's right. Um, are there any members that are not expected to be uh, able to attend 12-28? Everyone, every, can anyone not attend? I'll just ask in the negative. No? Okay, so if we can all be there 12-28. Um, Mr. Clifford, how does... Um, a 1228, you would be first out um, as a continuance, um, and it would uh, it wouldn't punish us too too dire too direly with uh, with three new applications right behind you. Sounds good. All right. Um, so, uh, do we have a motion uh, from the board um, on the applicant's request to continue to the hearing of 12 1228? So moved, Ken Swanton. Thank you, Mr. Swanton. Second, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Motions made and seconded by Mr. Swanton and Mr. Moore on the applicant's request to continue this, all three of the applications to the hearing date of December 28th. Um, calling the roll on the uh, motion, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. DeWile. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Yes. Mr. Channon. Yes. Mr. Bennick. Yes. Yes. Uh, I vote yes. That's six in the affirmative. The ayes have it. Motion carries and um, all three matters are uh, continued to the hearing of 1228. Thank you um, uh, to those that uh, stuck it out uh, to, uh, uh, to share your thoughts uh, as members of, you know, abutters or just members of the neighborhood or the public. And uh, to uh, Mr. Clifford and Mr. Clifford, thank you for your patience and your flexibility. Uh, so we'll see you on the 28th. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good, thank you. Um, okay, uh, members of the CBA, we, uh, we now have arrived at uh, the end of our public hearings. Uh, we'll close the portion of the public hearing uh, section of our meeting and move into our business meeting where we have one matter on for our attention, which is the approval of the minutes of uh, November 9th, 2021. I was absent for that hearing, so um, I, uh, I won't have any thoughts or comments on it, but does anyone wish to make any comments, corrections, um, or uh, in the absence of that, does anyone wish to make a motion to approve? I move we approve the minutes, Ken Swanton. Second, and Mark Moore. It was made and seconded uh, by Mr. Swanton and Mr. Moore to approve the minutes. Um, calling the roll on the approval of the minutes, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Dwyer. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Yes. Mr. Shannon. Yes. Mr. Benick. Uh, I wasn't at that hearing either. So. Uh, Mr. Benick and I will uh, will will um, um, will defer. So uh, we have four in the affirmative. The ayes have it, the motion carries, the minutes are approved. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Gretchen, uh, for always keeping great minutes. Um, so uh, we have a certificate of vote, which we, uh, we, we will be pushing off. It's not quite ready yet, um, on advice of, uh, of Caitlin Sullivan and the planning office. Uh, that document will be presented to us likely at the next meeting, and if not, then by the 28th uh, for our consideration uh, or our electronic signature, but our, our vote to, uh, to sign it. Um, I have no further updates, uh, and uh, I just want to thank you all. It's, it's been a late evening, a lot of work. Um, thank you, uh, Caitlin. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, and thank you all for, uh, for hanging in there. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. moved. All right. <laughs> all those in favor, say aye. 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 You guys have it. All right. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Good night. Bye. Have a great Thanksgiving.